okay that's great then because uh, there was some technical issue due to which i was unable to uh, unmute myself but now it's fixed i guess so let us start the session is everybody there yes i can see hasib thank you so much i can see shaldil thank you so much shaldia sorry shaldia then uh, siddharth and uh, hasib again okay what about others uh, are you aware that others are about to join or what are you aware if others are about to join No, sir, there's no batch group as of now. Okay, not an issue. So uh, let us just have a quick summary of our yesterday's session, and then we will start with our today's session. So do you remember from where we started our discussion and uh, what all key points we discussed about in our last session, in our first session? Anything, anything from anywhere, not the sequential one. Slabers, okay, we discussed about the ACCA slabers. Then we discussed about the exam pattern or the exam structure. That's great. Okay. Sir, we are unable to unmute ourselves. Yes, I think the host has not allowed others to unmute themselves other than the faculty. So you can be active on the chat box for today. And uh, then I'll uh, ask them uh, what is the problem. Initially, I was also on unmute. Uh, I was also on mute. I was not uh, being given the permission to unmute myself. Okay. So not an issue. You can be on the chat box for today. Okay. Types of audit procedures. Okay, we discussed about types of audit procedure. We'll have a quick summary, but let us just uh, revise the topics for now and then we'll have a quick summary. Okay, then basic terminologies of audit, which we are going to study in detail today because we didn't get proper time to study about it yesterday. So we'll study that again today in very much detail. So we'll be spending roughly 20, 25 minutes on that part so that we are able to grasp it properly because we will be using it later on. Now we can unmute. Okay, that's great. That's great. So you can answer by unmuting yourself as well as on uh, the chat box. It's your choice. Okay. And what all? Uh, what other thing did we discuss about? Anything else? It's about the three stages of uh, audit. Okay. That is in execution and reporting. Definitely. There could be a little bit changes in the words that we will be using in the technical terms, but for uh, understanding, planning, execution, and reporting or completion, that would be great. Okay. Okay. So now let us just have a sequential revision of all contents that we discussed about yesterday as yesterday was our first session. So, so let's, uh, let us just have a quick summary of that session. And then we will be starting with our today's session. Okay, so I'll present my screen first. Okay, please let me know in the chat box when you can see the screen. So we can. Great. So uh, initially we started with the basic introduction of each other, right? After that, uh, we discussed about the slavers. So we discussed about certain sections of the slavers in which we talked about regulatory environment majorly, then professional and ethical considerations, then quality management and practice management. We are not going into the depth of it. And then the most important part would, uh, would be the planning and conducting uh, of an audit of historical financial information and then completion, review and reporting. These two topics are going to be very vast and very interesting. Then we discussed about certain other assignments, which included due diligence, a review of interim financial information, prospective financial information, forensic audit, and there would be certainly more like integrated reporting. So we would be discussing about all of them in detail in the later part of this discussion. Then we discussed about certain current issues and developments. And we also got to know that these current issues and developments would not be asked or might not be asked directly in the question but it might form part of certain questions and then we discussed about professional skills so do you remember what would be the uh, uh, portion of professional skills what, what would be the marks allotted for professional skills in your examination 20, 20, marks. 20, marks. 20 marks okay 20 marks and then it would be distributed into three questions so 10 marks in question number one and then five five marks in question number two or uh, two and three that is how it would be divided okay then 
uh, employability and technological skills, uh, technology skills, which would be a further addition. Then we discussed about the format of the uh, format of the examination. There would be three questions. Question number one would be case study, which would be 50 marks and it would include 10 marks of professional. I'm just being very quick because we are just revising. Then question number two and three would be short scenarios in which there would be two questions. And we discussed about from which part it could be asked predominantly, which is this one completion, review and reporting. OK. Then we discussed about certain other points that current issues would not be asked uh, standalone, but it could form part of certain other questions. And then we discussed about certain important points. The point to be noted here is that we discussed about certain standards, which we would again be revising today. So let's not throw much light on that now. And then we discussed about exam success skills, which is managing information, correct interpretation of the requirements, answer planning, efficient numerical analysis, effective writing and presentation and good time management. All of this we would be taking up later on when we would be solving the questions in much more detail. And then we started our discussion with the planning, execution and reporting, which is the audit process. And we discussed about that. Then we discussed about types of audit procedures. So can you recall audit types of audit procedures? Can you recall types of audit procedures? Mnemonic is ICAIORR. ICAIORR, exactly correct. Inspection, confirmation. Analytical procedure. Analytical, analytical procedure. procedure. Okay. Inquiry. Inquiry. Okay. Observation. Recalculation, re Recalculation and re-performance. That's great. That's great. Okay. So uh, let us just take one one example because I'm sure that we would be able to explain in technical terms that what all these audit procedures are. Uh, although there is no technical term, so it would be plain English. We can uh, explain that. But let us take one one example so that to ensure just to ensure that we understand it correctly. What do we mean by inspection? Can you give me an example? Where would we use okay. inspection? In which scenario we would use inspection as our audit procedure? Inspection? So inspection can be used to check the existence of an asset. Existence of an asset. asset? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Physical verification, maybe. Yes. Inspection. Yes. Okay. Rights and obligations, basically. Okay. Or okay, uh, infrastructure. Could... Okay. Yes, that's true. Uh, also, we can use it for sample testing also. That we would be inspecting the vouchers. So that is how we can do it. Then the second one is confirmation. Where can we use confirmation? Debtors confirmation. Debtors confirmation, cash and bank confirmation. So we can use that. Okay. Can we use for third party also? So I'm just giving you a new case scenario where uh, we are one company, say A Limited. Okay. We have certain inventories. Some of those inventories are kept at some other party's place. So for example, there's a company called B Limited, which produces our products. Okay. So now some of our inventory is kept over there as a, the reporting date. So can we take confirmation for that also? Yes, sir. Absolutely. For job definitely. works and all. Yes. For job works. Yes, definitely. So we can take confirmations for that also. Then uh, next one would be ICA, which is analytical procedure. So can you give me an example of analytical procedure other than rent, of course, which we discussed yesterday? Anything? Uh, for any of the expenses. For so any of the expenses. Okay, we can do that. Yes. Uh, I'll give you one good example of this. So for payroll cost also, you can do so, right? Because uh, you know your number of employees, right? You know the average salary in your company. So for example, there are 50 employees or for ease of calculation, there are 100 employees, okay? And now you have said that the average salary in your company is say $1,000 a month, okay? So 100 employees and average salary is $1,000. So your monthly monthly debit to the employee benefit expenses or the payroll expenses should be somewhere around 100,000. If it is 100,000, then you can say that, okay, the average, uh, the average expenses are rationalized. If it is going beyond that or much more uh, beyond the average, then you can inspect it further. So you can use that in analytical procedure in payroll also. You can also use it in revenue also, that number of average units sold and what is the average basket size. Okay, then uh, the next one would be inquiry. Where can you use inquiry as your procedure? Inquiry as your procedure? Admin expense, electricity, analytical procedure. Okay, great. Inquiry as a procedure, where can you use inquiry? We discussed about one example, understanding the business. Other than that, where you can use it? Uh, corporate structure, management, corporate structure, details of management. I'll give you one more good example here also uh, legal and professional expen expenses or legal and professional cases. So uh, there's an element of contingent liability, right? That legal cases put against the company. 
now there is no uh, legitimate way or an accurate way to understand that what all cases has, has been filed against the company the only way to do that is management representation or inquiry procedure with the management yes so we can use our inquiry procedures while determining the legal cases against the company or the contingent liabilities against the company okay icaio observation where can we use observation other than physical verification of inventory or fixed asset observation process walkthroughs oh process walkthroughs yes we can use observation as an as an audit procedure and process walkthroughs okay that's great uh, then reperform uh, recalculation first tax depreciation uh, depreciation tax we discussed yesterday i'm uh, just uh, planning to give you certain more examples which we didn't dis discuss yesterday just to have a brief understanding and just to give a more quality to our answers so other calculate than calculate payroll Calculate. Based on attendance and yes, based on attendance expenses. payroll. Yes, yes, based on attendance, calculate payroll. Definitely, yes, we can do that. That if the average uh, working days in the company was say twenty six days, then we can calculate it uh, for twenty six days. Okay, okay, that's great. Uh, then the last one is reperformance. Where can we reperform it? Depreciation. Sorry. Depreciation. Depreciation, uh, that would not be re-performance, I feel. Uh, okay. That would be more yeah. of recalculation, right? So re-performance. Can we recalculate the inventory in the inventory account that we would be doing at the reporting date? Can we recalculate the inventory if required? Recalculation would usually be a difficult process, no, sir, because uh, inventory usually are of large scale. So yes, but not for every inventory. We can take one sample that okay, we would be recalculating it instead of just observing the other person calculating it. If required, we could also go there and count some part of the inventory ourselves. Also, we can do that. Yes, as an auditor, we can do that. I'm not saying that we should do it or we have to do it, but we can do it. So if we decide to do that, that would be an example of re-performance. That is, you are re-performing certain audit procedure. Or we can... Right, you, yes, okay. Okay, so after discussing about the types of audit procedures, we moved towards certain basic audit terminologies, which we are going to throw a lot of light on today. Because uh, yesterday we just discussed about the brief of these points. And after discussing about these audit terminologies, we would be going towards the understanding of basic in international standards on auditing so that we are aware about the names of it. We are aware about how these standards are formulated because we would not be understanding the standards uh, sequentially. What we would be doing is we would be taking the reference of these standards wherever relevant. So that is why I would like to have or I would like to give you a brief understanding about these all international standards on auditing. So we would go to the book and we would be reading about it. Okay. So number one, assertions. What did we understand for assertions yesterday? What do we mean by assertions? Checkpoints like existence, occurrence, valuation, completeness, disclosure. Okay. So these are the checkpoints uh, on which audit procedures are based. So we can say that any audit procedure is performed to address some or the other assertion, right? Yes, sir. It is a claim made by the management, basically. Yes, that it is complete or not. Do we have the right and obligations to it or not? So can you give me uh, certain names of the assertion, like existence and occurrence is one? Evaluation. Valuation, okay. Completeness. Completeness. Disclosures. Disclosure, presentation, disclosure, yeah. Disclaimers. Rights and obligations. Uh, not disclaimers, uh, rights and obligations. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, accuracy is also there. In some cases, in some syllabus, accuracy uh, and cutoffs are also mentioned as assertions. So you might uh, see certain syllabus or certain guidances where you will see that accuracy and cutoffs are also mentioned as the assertion. So that is also correct. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about the assertions, 
let us throw a bit more light on these kind of assertions. So when we say we are testing completeness, what is the way of testing completeness? Let us take one example. Okay, let us take the example of fixed assets or tangible assets for that matter. Okay, property, plant and equipment, tangible assets. Now we want to check the completeness of tangible assets. Uh, tangible assets. What is the way to do that? So whether the transaction is recorded at the correct value and uh, the matching concept has been followed, depreciation, oh. depreciation. No, no. And just, all... just the balance sheet effect, just the balance sheet effect, property, plant and equipment, tangible asset, just the balance sheet effect, not the depreciation PNL part. Just the statement of position effect. So we will check that uh, specific unique code allocated to specific asset. Okay, okay, so we can do that. To do that we will uh, physically verify that, uh, ensure that all the assets are uh, taken in FAR. Definitely, we can do that, we can do that. So there are two methods which are practically followed. I'll tell you one by one, okay? For completeness, I'm telling you there are two methods. Number one, what you can do is, uh, you can check the amount that is appearing on your balance sheet. So say it is $100,000 that you have the tangible assets of $100,000. And then you can go to a document called FAR, which is fixed assets register or tangible assets register. And then you can see that whether the breakup of amount that is being given there, whether the total of those amounts matches to your balance sheet or not. That is one way, but that is not the foolproof way. The other way, the better way of doing it is to match it with a physical verification report. So that is why physical verification report is compulsory not every year, but once in three years or once in five years in different regions of the world. So what you should do ideally do is you could, you should get a physical verification report and then you should match the quantity of these items with the items given in your fixed assets reg register. Do we understand this first of all for the completeness part? Yes. Yes. So completeness is more related to the quantity rather than the value. Then the second one is related to existence and occurrence so existence is for a statement of financial position which is balance sheet and occurrence is for a statement of profit and loss which is pnl so can, uh, can you tell me how would we check the existence of fixed assets can you tell me how can we check the existence of fixed assets inspection sir inspection okay we can check the existence of uh, fixed asset via inspection via physical verification okay that is one good way and how would we check the occurrence of uh, any pnl item occurrence yes. can we uh, can we get the evidence of occurrence of a pnl item which is any expense through a uh, grn through purchase order through invoice can we uh, get so through agreements. Yes, sir. By way of vouchers. Definitely by way of vouchers. That is also one good way. So existence and occurrence. Then rights and obligations. Rights and obligations. How would we check the rights and obligations of tangible fixed assets or for tangible fixed assets? Lease agreements. Lease agreements. agreements. Okay, uh, lease agreements, or I would say the ownership agreements, uh, which would summarize, which would summarize all of all kinds of agreements. So all kind mm -hmm. of ownership agreements, which gives us title, which gives us title to that particular fixed asset, right? So title right. deed, whether right. it's a car, whether it's a property, it it could be anything, but title deed. That is the ownership should be in our name. If not ownership, then the long term lease should be in our name. Okay, then the next one is related to accuracy cutoff. Let us not take the example for that because it is not everywhere mentioned as an assertion. Okay, then we discussed about misstatements. What did we, uh, what do we mean by misstatements? We gave it a very particular description. What do we mean by misstatements? What is and what should be? Difference between what is and what should be is misstatement. So can you, can you give me some example which we didn't discuss yesterday? Uh, charge on de uh, depreciation charge, what should be uh, as per our calculations and okay. what has been recognized in the PNL? Okay, okay, okay. That is one good example. Okay. Uh, anything more? Any other example? Agreement rates. Rates agreement as per rate. the agreement versus what have been charged in the invoice. 
okay okay that is one good point that that is one good point okay now let us take uh, one example where what has been done is that there are two errors okay in the payroll there are two errors number one the employees that the number of employees that is the head count of employees that should be there as per our calculation because the initial the opening head count of the employees was say 100 employees okay 10 employees have joined and 5 have resigned okay so 100 plus 10 minus 5 is 105 right the closing head count should be 105 but the company says that the closing head count is only 103 that is two employees less can it be called as a misstatement Yes. Okay. I'll again repeat for others. So the opening headcount or the opening number of employees in a company as on 1st January was 100 employees. 10 employees have joined during the current financial year. So the total employees was 110. But 5 employees have resigned also. So the net amount or the net headcount is 105. But as on 31st of December, that is the closing date, the company is saying that we only have 103 employees. So there is a difference of two employees as per our calculation and as per the data given by client. Now, can we say that this is a misstatement first of all? Yes, sir. Yes. There is a deviance. There is a deviance. Uh, there is a deviation. So it would be a misstatement. Can we say that it is a material misstatement? Based on the given information, can we say that it is a material misstatement? Based on the given, I don't think so because... As of now, based on this information, we don't have any impact on the organization okay. in terms of materiality, like what amount and what kind of activities these two employees might be into. Okay. Okay. We'll extend this example when we understand the next heading, which is materiality. Okay. We'll take the uh, uh, same example so that we are able to understand it in a much better way. Okay. Now let us go to the second scenario first. We'll take, we'll continue the scenario in the materiality discussion just after this one. Okay. Now the second scenario is the employee cost or the payroll cost or the employee benefit expenses that should be booked as per our calculation, as per the re-performance or the recalculation done by us should be $100,000. But it has been booked as $120,000. Can it be called as a misstatement first of all? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. sir. It would be a misstatement because it is difference between what is and what should be. So that is why I have given you the clear idea of what is a misstatement. Now let us talk about materiality and then let us uh, continue the first case that we discussed about. What is materiality first of all? When can you say that some item is material? Which is crucial for decision maker of stakeholders. Crucial for decision making. Okay, one good definition. Have a significant, significant impact on the uh, financials. Okay, significant impact on the financial. That is again one good point. Okay, uh, do you all remember that we uh, we discussed about one particular definition yesterday of materiality, whether something is material or not? Impacts the decision making. Yes. So anything could be called as a material if it has the ability to impact the decision making of users of financial statement. Yes, we discussed that. That materiality means anything which has the ability or the capability to influence the decision making of users of financial statements that would be called as a materiality now you said that missing two employees might not be material so instead of giving you the answer i'll give you the concept first and then we would be discussing about the answer first of all can you uh, can you tell me that whether materiality would always be in the financial terms or the uh, quantity terms or it could be in the qualitative terms also it can be in the qualitative terms oh, right Either, so, either of them, sir. Either of them, yes. So materiality could be in the quantitative term as well as the qualitative term. Can you give me one example where something might not appear material, but it is material due to its quality or qualitative factor? So like in the given case, if these yeah. two employees held a higher position in yeah. the business structure, yeah. And uh, if they absconded, so th yeah. there we have the process lack where we are yeah. not able to trace back or even identify the employees who have left and updated in our systems. Also, if their approvals and everything will get affected accordingly. So definitely, it's material. Very, definitely. Very good example. That is why I didn't give you the exam uh, answer then because it is not important that only two employees are missing. 
what is more significant and what is more important here is that two employees are missing that is the process controls because payroll is considered as a significant account in a lot of companies or in almost all companies so if two employees could be missing without following the due approval or without following the due process then there could be more process lags which might not be identified by the company during the year correct so even if the salary of these two employees was very low was not very material uh, materialistic or very material as far as amount is concerned but it would still be called as material due to its qualitative factor that is two employees are missing who have absconded or who are not in the accounting of the company without following the due process so there is a process like there's an element of process like and that is why these two employees would be considered material the missing of these two employees would be considered as material even if the amount is very low do we understand this first of all yes sir sir yes. can we also consider the example of uh, contingent liabilities in this case for instance some contingent liabilities uh, quantity wise they might be less but they have a, a brand uh, effect on the organization Def definitely definitely so i'll give you one practical example which i faced okay uh, although it is a very uh, low example it is a very um, detail oriented example so just try to feel the importance of the example instead of going for the amount of it so what happened was i was auditing one company okay i won't name the company but i was auditing one company and when i was auditing that company i got to know about one contingent liability that there was a factory of that company in one of the cities of india now every factory has a bigger gate we must have seen big big gates in factories right so one of those gates got broken and it got crashed with with a child okay and that child got injured severely okay so now the parents of the child filed a case against the company okay although the payout that was paid to the child was very low was very low okay it was not at all material for the company it was the 10% of that amount would, would also on the 10 times of that amount would also not be material for the company but when the case was going on do you think that we would have considered it as material can you please answer so we didn't get your point uh, okay, i didn't okay. get your question not not an issue not an issue i'll explain again so there was a company okay there was a company uh, it had a huge factory okay that fact uh, tree had a big big gate very big gate okay very big entry gate now that gate gate got broken and it got crashed with the child okay so the child got injured because he cra uh, crashed with that particular factory gate due to the mistake of the factory and the child got severely injured okay now the parents of the child filed a case against the company do we understand it till here yes yes so what happened was although the payout that was paid to the child or the family of the child was very low it was not at all material for the company but when the case was going on so the case was going on for roughly 4 to 5 years okay for those 4 to 5 years do you think that we would have considered this case which is contingent liability we might have to pay we might not have to pay we don't know but do you think that we would have considered it as material yes sir yes, definitely sir. because there was negative publicity going all around in all the news channels that okay such a in such an incident has happened with a child in such company so there was a lot of negative publicity there was a lot of uh, activists that were active against the company and that is why even if the transaction amount was very low we considered it as a material due to its qualitative factors so we understand the meaning of materiality materiality so it also shows lack of maintenance it also it shows a very uh, important gap in the process for maintenance check okay um in this particular case it was not there because i just gave you an extract of the information in this particular case it was planned maintenance only du during maintenance only this happened okay so, okay, okay yeah so i just gave you an extract of the information but yes if it would have happened without planning or without planned maintenance then also lack of maintenance uh, would be there okay so materiality means what materiality means that anything which has the impact of or which has the ability to impact the decision making of users of financial statement it could be any user it could be shareholder it could be supplier it could be customer now there is one word that i would like to explain to you all which is really important for us to understand in the auditing terms although it is not mentioned here do we understand the meaning of stakeholders do we understand the meaning of stakeholders yes sir 
uh, what do we mean by stakeholders? Uh, we've got shareholders, we've got employees. Okay. Customers. Okay. If we have to define stakeholders in any terms, okay. When we, when I say define, okay, I don't mean the technical definition only, okay. When I say define, I just want to know the concept behind it. Instead of giving the examples, I just need to know the concept. So you can use any language, you can use any set of words, okay. It's not just like we have to mug up certain sentences. But can you please define me the meaning of stakeholders? Any party that is affected by the existence and the working of the organization. Okay, that is one good definition. Anybody else? Anyone who is internally or externally connected with the organization. Okay, okay. All of these are good definitions. Okay, I'll just give you one more. Okay, all of these are correct. 100% correct. I'm just giving you one more, a bit more framed one. Okay. So in technical terms, what we say for stakeholders is anybody who is, who is either interested in or is impacted by the operations of a company is called a stakeholder. Okay, I'll repeat. Anybody who is either interested in the operations of the company or is affected by it is called as a stakeholder. So now, can you give me the examples which you are giving? Basically, there are two types of stakeholders, external stakeholders and internal stakeholders. Okay. One within okay. the organization, such as employees and uh, debtors and you know suppliers, customers okay. and all those. Sorry. Uh, shareholders. The, 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 yeah, yeah, shareholders, etc. And the external ones are like government, regulators, and okay. these. I just have a slight doubt here. Your answer is 100% correct. Just a slight doubt here. Uh, why did you include debtors and creators into the internal stakeholders and not the external ones? So because they're, they're being are accounted directly, by... connected with the, directly connected with the uh, operations of the organization. Okay, okay, okay. So I have a different view here. Uh, I personally think that... Uh, creditors and debtors would be considered under the external stakeholders although that is not very relevant for our syllabus okay we are not going to be asked that is uh, is this person or is this creditor or debtor an internal or external stakeholder but i personally feel that creditor and debtor would be external stakeholders because they are external parties okay they do not get involved into the day-to-day -day business or they do not have direct interest into the business and that is why they would be called as external stakeholders just like government okay so i personally feel that although this is not part of the triple a syllabus so let's not discuss it a, a bit further but that is my opinion on it okay so we understood the meaning of assertion we understood the meaning of message statements and we understood the meaning of materiality then audit risk we just discussed about a bit of audit risk yesterday right what do we mean by audit risk Uh, the risk that the auditor expresses uh, no. an unimportant audit opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated. Okay. Okay. So what I'll do is, uh, see, this is a PPT. So what I'll do is I'll just back it and we'll try to write something here. Okay. And you tell me then. Okay. Now, auditor, auditor's opinion is appropriate okay uh, are you able to see what i'm writing yeah yes auditor's opinion is appropriate okay and financial statements which i'm calling here fs for uh, our discussion fs are like really misstated uh no what i'm trying to i'm trying to frame sentences here uh, cases here so we'll be discussing with a lot of cases so that okay. we are aware about the audit risk okay so auditor's opinion is appropriate and the fs are not materially misstated. Okay, materially misstated. I'll be writing it like this. Okay, materially misstated. Will that work? Oh, yes. yes. So, auditor's opinion is appropriate and financial statements are not materially misstated. First of all, I'll, I would like to explain what do we mean by appropriate here. Okay. So, as of now, we have not discussed about the types of opinion that we need to, uh, that an auditor might issue. But let us just have a brief discussion, okay? So there are four kinds of opinion that an auditor might issue. One is unmodified opinion that everything is correct and as per the reporting framework, right? There could be one adverse opinion that everything is materially misstated or there are pervasive material misstatements, right? Yes, sir. Brilliant. Yes, there could be disclaimer of opinion when auditor fails to obtain evidences or fails to ex express opinion in simple terms if we say, right? And since a lot of you are Indian Chartered Accountants, so I expect that you must be aware about these things, right? 
then there is one qualified opinion which is subject to opinion that everything is fair true and fair except for some items right all of these are quali qualified opinion and these are the types of opinion okay so when we say appropriate here appropriate means what was intended to be issued or what should be issued has been issued okay that is the whole meaning of appropriate here we are not commenting on whether it is a, a unmodified opinion whether it is a modified opinion okay we are just saying that whatever opinion would be issued uh, would, should have been issued it has been issued okay so do we understand the meaning of appropriate first yes yes sir yes so ap appropriate opinion could be any opinion okay so auditor's opinion is appropriate okay and financial statements are not materially misstated okay first There's first no of all risk. yes no no this is not audit risk i'm just explaining you with a lot of examples okay so first of all tell me if fs are not if financial statements are not materially misstated okay there is no material misstatement which type of opinion should be issued as per you as per your current knowledge unmodified unmodified opinion right mm -hmm. so unmodified opinion should be issued and unmodified opinion has been issued is it a, is it an audit risk no no okay so did you understand this case first that when fs are not materially misstated and auditor's opinion is appropriate there's no audit risk right yes sir now let us change it further financial statements are materially misstated okay okay uh, assume a scenario where they are pervasive there are pervasive misstatements and auditor should issue adverse opinion and it has issued appropriate opinion which is adverse opinion is it audit risk that no, material sir. material misstatements are there okay auditor should issue adverse opinion and it has issued appropriate opinion which is adverse opinion is it an audit risk no no sir no no okay now i am changing it here okay we have framed two sentences here now i am changing it here okay i am making it inappropriate now let us read it the financial statements are materially misstated or let us frame first sentence again not material the financial statements are not materially misstated okay an auditor has issued inappropriate opinion is it an audit risk this no might be a, this might be a little confusing so i would like more answers to be here financial statements are not materially misstated and auditor has issued inappropriate opinion first of all give me your answer i'll explain this case no no sir no? again this, this wouldn't involve any audit risk here. Okay, okay. I'll just explain this case, although you all understand this, but again, I'll explain it from my end. Okay, so when financial statements are not materially misstated, so audit opinion that should be issued should be unmodified opinion, right? But what auditor has done is auditor has issued either adverse opinion or disclaimer of opinion or qualified opinion, right? This is the, that case only, right? Yes, sir. Yes. So in this case also, there is no material misstatement uh, or there is no audit risk. Now let us discuss the last case, which is this one. That is, there are material misstatements in audit, but auditor has issued inappropriate opinion. That is, auditor should have issued either disclaimer of opinion or adverse opinion or qualified opinion, but it has issued unmodified opinion. Correct? This is that case? Yes, sir. So in this case, will there be audit risk? Yes, sir. Yes. In this case, there would be audit risk. Why? See, this is the explanation, but it is more important for us to understand why only this is covered as the audit risk. Now, get into a thought process where you are an investor, okay? Where you are an investor, okay? So, whatever answer you will give now, please give it from the point of view of an investor, okay? What happened was, you got the annual report of a company, okay, with the audit report also. You got the annual report with the audit report of a company. Now that audit report said that there are material misstatements in the company and that is why we are issuing adverse opinion, okay. So based on that information, you did not invest on the company. You did not invest on the company, okay. But after some months, you got to know that that audit report was wrong, okay. And there are uh, there should be unmodified opinion. That is, there are no material misstatements in the company. Did you lose any money? Did you lose any money? No, sir. No, sir. no you didn't. You didn't lose any money. Although there is, and there has been a loss of profit. But did you lose any faith? Did you lose any uh, money? Definitely not. Now let us 
reverse this scenario. Okay, you received the audit report of company. Okay, it said that everything is true and fair. Okay, everything is true and fair in the company. But after some time, you got to know that there are material misstatements in the company as a result of which you have lost certain money. In this case, did you lose money? Did you lose actual money? Yes, sir. And that is why this one is covered as the audit risk. The other one, in the other case, you did not lose any money as as an as a shareholder. But in this case, you lost money as a shareholder because this impacts the the stakeholders on a large level. And that is why only this part is covered as the audit risk because this is considered as the biggest risk for an auditor. First of all, do you understand this? Yes. Okay. So this is the yes, overall meaning of audit risk. Now I would like to cover one more point which is not mentioned here before moving towards audit evidence do you understand the meaning of true and fair true and fair yes sir okay can you please tell me the meaning of true and fair so when we are talking about a true financial statement yeah. we uh, we mean to say there is no misstatement everything that is and that should be is there okay and okay. fair everything every estimate that has to be taken is as per the best knowledge of as an auditor as the organization okay okay um if we so the transactions okay the yes, transactions please. are okay. uh, the transactions as reported in the financial statements are complete and accurate okay and uh, okay. are in compliance with the applicable uh, framework Okay, applicable financial reporting framework, which you called FRF, right? The great definition. Okay, okay. Uh, if we modify this true and fair with true and correct, what would change here? So what would in true and fair? We are talking about materiality. Well, in true and correct, we do not concern about materiality. We okay. Need to make everything accurate. Okay. Okay. Okay, understood this point. Okay, so I have got two uh, sets of answers here. Okay, number one, we said that true and fair means what? True and fair means every transaction has been booked correctly. Okay, in the manner it was intended to be recorded. And the second definition I got was that in true and fair, we considered materiality, whereas in true and correct, we do not consider materiality, right? We agree with these two answers, first of all. Yes. Yes, these two answers are correct. Although I would like to throw a bit more light on this. Okay, so do you know where we use true and correct? There is one audit opinion where we use true and correct. Tax audit report. Tax audit report. Okay, in Indian tax audit report, if we say okay, right, because there are certain people from other countries also. So in Indian tax audit report, we use true and correct, right? Although in all the statutory audit reports or external audit reports or independent auditors report, we use true and fair. Why is that? So I'll tell you. Okay. When we say true and correct, it means whatever the situation is, it should be booked in our books. So it, ha it has been booked in our books. Okay, I'll give you an example also. But in case of true and fair, what we say is that based on the given scenarios, based on the given scenarios, whatever, based on the given scenarios, whatever accounting should have been done, has been done. When we say this, then we can say true and fair. I'll give you one example. Okay. We have bought one machinery. Okay. Please, uh, please uh, write on the chat box or uh, be active on the uh, mic for now. Okay. So we have bought one machinery. Okay. Did you understand the, until here? We bought one machinery for hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Now what we have done is we have given this machinery to our subsidiary company. Okay. A limited is the holding company. B limited is the subsidiary company. A limited, that is the holding company, bought one machinery for hundred thousand dollars, and it gave that machinery to B limited. Okay, the overall life of the machinery was say ten years, and A limited has given this machinery to B limited for nine years. Understood this case first of all? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In whose books this machinery should be recorded as an asset? Subsidiary. The invoice is in the name of holding company. Okay, A limited. Now, please tell me in your opinion, okay, there might be differing opinions. There might be uh, disputive opinions here, but just tell me from your uh, opinion that in whose company this machinery should be recorded in a, as an asset, A limited holding company or B limited subsidiary company? A limited, A limited. Okay. B limited, okay. sir. If you consider the substance over form, 
yeah then delimited should be uh, the right okay okay understood your point so there are differing answers right i so, think sir a holds the risk and rewards and b could be considered as more like a lease because it's less than the complete life of the asset okay okay just give just to give you more information b limited is not paying anything to a limited for this machinery okay okay yeah b limited is not paying anything and it's, it's a related, related part yes it's a subsidiary company yeah so uh, first of all instead of uh, jumping on the answers uh, for now do we understand that there are differing opinions here right for the same scenario for a very simple scenario right and do you think this must be ha happening a lot of times in in the uh, practical world that holding company might be buying something and giving to uh, giving to subsidiary companies this generally happens for accounting softwares also right yes, sir. Yes, sir. holding company buys one good accounting software like sap erp or quickbooks or sometimes tally also tally prime also and then they license or license is given by them to the subsidiary companies right so this usually happens in the practical world also and this simple transaction has differing opinions right so let us understand true and fair and true and correct from this way only okay if we would be auditing it for tax audit okay or our motive would have been to issue true and correct opinion who should book it as an asset a limited a limited a limited why because whatever the scenarios even if you have given it to uh, b limited the subsidiary company for 9 years whatever the scenarios who owns it a limited a owns limited it, right who has the invoice in their name a limited so whatever the scenarios even if you have given it for 9 years even if you would have given it for 10 years also the fact says that a limited is the owner so a limited should book it as its asset matter closed this, that is the meaning of true and correct that whatever factual information is there it has been presented okay did you understand this first yes understood sir yes now let's take the another case okay when we would be issuing true and fair opinion true and fair true as in factual but fair fair as in we would be taking account the circumstances so in this case the circumstances say that a limited has purchased this machinery but it has given this machinery to b limited which is its subsidiary company related company for 9 years without any consideration so essentially a limited has bought this machinery for b limited and b limited would be using it for 90% of its useful life that is majority of its useful life correct these are the circumstances right yes, sir and that is why we would say that we would account for it under substance over the form that is in substance in substance b limited has bought the machinery whereas the form says that a limited has bought, bought the machine so we would go beyond the factual reasoning and we would see that what is happening in substance so in substance b limited has bought the machinery so b limited would account for it under its own asset first of all did you understand this right sir wonderful illustration thank you so much in this case we would say true and fair opinion has been issued okay so that is what is really important for us to understand the true and correct and true and fair that is why initially when audit practice was, was happening initially we used to issue true and correct opinion okay but there are a lot of transactions like this there are a lot of transaction like this and companies used to say that since you have to issue true and correct opinion so in fact in factual terms it is owned by a limited so you should disclose a limited assets right but when substance over the form concept came into play the company realized or the audit profession realized that we should look beyond true and correct and we should go for the fairness of the transaction that is substance over the form and we should issue true and fair opinion only that is we would be taking account uh, considerations also circumstances also into consideration okay first of all do we understand it till here yes sir yes so that yes, is the yes thank you so much so that is the overall meaning of true and fair and true and correct now we have crossed roughly one hour of the session to so would you like to take the break now yeah yes, sir. yes? yes so sir. let's take five minutes of break and then we would resume with audit evidence and its types because this is going to be a, a bit more detailed discussion and uh, we might not be able to take breaks for another one hour right sure, sir. So let's take five minutes break but please be back in five minutes okay so that we can resume the session
Okay, so are we back? Please let me know when you guys are back so that we can resume the session. Yes. Thank, thank you, Shaldia. Okay, what about others? Okay, I'm just waiting for others to join. Back. Back, okay. What about Hasib, Kui? Sir, Hasib is back. Okay, Hasib is back, great. Okay, so now let us, start discussing about audit evidence and its types okay so we would be be having a brief discussion about audit evidence first of all what do we mean by audit evidence audit evidences are the evidences that we obtain as part of our audit procedures or the audit uh, plan to support or to conclude on the audit and support our conclusion right that is the whole definition of audit evidence evidences that we obtain as part of the audit process to support our conclusion. That is the overall definition of audit evidences. Do we have certain other definitions, certain other explanation for audit evidences that could be considered as better audit evidences? Information that is used to arrive at an opinion on the financial statement. Information that is used to arrive for an opinion on the financial statement. Okay, that's great. Okay. Okay. Now, are we aware about types of audit evidences? What are the types of audit evidences? Are we aware about it? You can so name do you them. mean it in the sense of uh, sufficiency and appropriateness. Uh, th those are the characteristics of audit evidences. When I say uh, types of audit evidences, I'll give you one example. It could be persuasive, right? Okay, persuasive and corroborative. Persuasive, corroborative. Uh, there are four. So, do you remember other two? No, sir, not really. Okay. Um, conclusive, can we say conclusive audit evidences? Yes, sir. Right. So let us study about these three first, and then we would be discussing about later on later, uh, the other ones. Okay. So first of all, persuasive audit evidence. What do we understand by the meaning persuasion? Persuasion, just a simple English word persuasion. What do we mean by it? To persuade, persuasion. It gives us an idea of, right? To convince. To convince, yes, to give us an idea of, right? So persuasive reasonable, and reasonable, reasonable. yes. Yes, or in audit terms, we can, we can also call it as the 
first level of evidences okay so for example if we are saying that we are, we have to audit cash and bank balances okay right if we are working in the audit industry we must have audited cash and bank balances one or the other time right so let us take the example of cash and bank balances only in case of cash and bank balances although there are multiple levels of evidences involved as well as available but what is the first level of evidence that you take for cash and bank balances bank statement bank statement okay you take the bank statement right not the bank confirmation but you take the bank statement right and you try to match it or if i go further you take the brs right bank reconciliation statement correct yeah. you take the bank reconciliation statement so what happens in case of cash and bank balances if you focus on the bank statement for now bank balances for now you start with the bank reconciliation statement there a bank balance is mentioned over there okay the first thing is to match that bank balance with your books right you do that correct right right so that would be called as a persuasive audit evidence persuasive as in the one that is reasonable or that gives you the first hand of evidence okay Correct, first of all uh, is this clear now <laughs> let us discuss about the corroborative evidence corroborative evidence so what could be a corroborative what do we mean by corroborative in general english terms corroborate which, which confirms another uh, information which confirms okay or which gives further details about the existing thing right can we say that as corroborative right yes sir through so, to give further details about some existing thing right so when we say corroborative evidence what happens is it gives us the further evidence for an existing evidence so for example for bank balance we have one existing evidence which is bank reconciliation statement now the corroborative evidence would be something else which is what corroborative evidence for bank balance what could be the corroborative evidence like subsequent uh, bank confirmation okay okay understood your point so i'll give you the answer for this one and then we will take one more example and then we'll discuss okay why this was incorrect okay so the corroborative ev evidence in this case would be bank statement okay so what you have done is you have obtained one bank balance you have checked the bank reconciliation statement which is the persuasive evidence then you went ahead and then you checked the bank statement right the bank statement that is generated from the company on bank's website so you have matched the balance of brs with that bank statement can this be called as corroborative evidence this gave you further evidence for an existing evidence right sir right now it has increased the reliance of uh, brs yes it has increased the reliance of bank reconciliation statement now when we say we have obtained a bank confirmation can it be called as corroborative or conclusive conclusive uh, okay conclusive yes it would be conclusive that now bank has also confirmed that we hold this much balance for this much party for this party so that is called as a conclusive evidence and this is the basic basic example to understand about persuasive evidence corroborative evidence and conclusive evidence now there's one more fourth category of evidence which goes uh, a bit uh, odd from here which is contradictory evidence do you understand the meaning of contradictory yes so one evidence goes against the another evidence can, so there is a conflicting you, interest okay can you give me one example related to the bank statement or the bank balance that we have just discussed contradictory evidence we have discussed about three persuasive corroborative conclusive now contradictory so brs is not matching with bank confirmation okay that is contradictory right i'll give you one more example which would help you to understand it very clearly okay now when you generate a bank statement okay or when you receive bank confirmation you must have seen that bank does not just mention your savings account your current account balance they also mention your fixed deposit balance right for the same client yes now what happened was when you checked the books or when you checked the brs or when you checked the bank statement or any of the uh, uh, details given by the client you did not find any fixed deposits with say hdfc bank but when you received the confirmation of hdfc bank there was one fixed deposit also mentioned can this be called as contradictory evidences 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So these would be contradictory evidences. One evidence was that there is no FD, but in confirmation there is there is one FD mentioned. There is one fixed deposit mentioned. So this could be called as contradictory. Okay. So this example would help you to understand the types of audit evidences as well. Then audit report. First of all, what do we understand by the audit report? Uh, can you tell me one company uh, for which you have seen the audit report and it is publicly available? Do not uh, name your uh, the confidential clients, but any company's audit report, which you must have seen publicly, which is available Reliance. in the public domain, Reliance, Reliance. Okay, you, okay, Reliance Industries Limited, India based. Okay. Uh, what about others? As part of your work, outside your work, for your investment, for anything, but you have seen one audit report and it is publicly available, two conditions. Infosys. Infosys. Okay. What all paragraph have you seen? Uh, if possible, please name it sequentially, if possible. Sir, it consists of addressee. Addresses opinion. Okay. First Basis of all, the heading. Opinion. Okay. First of all, the heading, which is independent auditors report, right? Throughout the world, it is yes. same independent auditors report. Then the address it to the members of to the shareholders of this 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 company, right? Uh, yeah. then opinion. Opinion right? heading. Okay. Basis opinion. for opinion. Basis for opinion, right? Going concern. Okay. If there are any key audit matters, going concern, anything, uh, other matter paragraph. Emphasis of meta paragraph than that. Okay. The extra information, yeah. the extra paragraph. Then management's uh, responsibility paragraph. Manag okay. Management responsibility paragraph. Auditor's responsibility paragraph. Aud auditor responsibility paragraph, right? And then uh, uh, legal and regulatory requirements. That legal paragraph and regulatory. Well, okay. That, 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 is, that is specific for India, not uh, mentioned uh, anywhere else in the world. Right. Then. Then the conclusion of the report, right? Signing and all these things, yes. right? Yes, so signature, place. Yes, signature, place, and all these things, all the conclusive formalities of the report, right? So, what I want to focus a bit more light on is the audit report opinion paragraph, okay? So, there's one opinion paragraph, there's one basis for opinion paragraph, right? Now, when we would be moving towards the international standards on auditing, just after this discussion, we would be getting a bit more idea about that. But let us have a brief discussion for now. Okay. So I think this is the right time to discuss basics about the audit opinion. Okay. I'm not saying that we are having the expert knowledge on this right now. We would be discussing it further whenever the reference would come into our syllabus. But for now, we are just having the basic, the basic discussion for the audit opinions. Okay. So there are four words. There are four words which would help us to understand that. So that is why I am taking the help of those words. Okay. There's something called, you can uh, make this if you want. Okay. There's something called pervasive. There's something called not pervasive. First of all, what is the meaning of pervasive? In all aspects, all encompassing. In, okay. In all aspects, all encompassing. Can we say universal? Yes, sir. Yes. So we can say universal for pervasive, right? Now, when we say universal in auditing terms or in the audit of financial statement, we mean that it has effect over the whole financial statement, right? That is the meaning of pervasive, that having effect over all finance, the whole financial statement, right? Now, what I'm writing here is, first of all, RMMS. What can we say RMMS? What could be the full form? The risk of material misstatement. Okay, risk of material misstatement is present in financial statement. Okay, I'm just framing it as in short so that you understand it. Okay, risk of material misstatement is present in financial statements. And the other one is auditor fails to obtain S and A means what S and A? Sufficient and appropriate audit. Okay, why not others are answering? Uh, can I see the attendance of others, please? Yes. 
थैंक यू शालिया वॉट अबाउट अदर्स वॉट अबाउट अदर्स प्लीज ओके हाय सिद्धार्थ सिद्धार्थ राइट यस ओके ओके सो वॉट आई एम ट्राइंग टू डू इज आई एम ट्राइंग टू सिंप्लीफाई द फ्रेम ऑफ ओपिनियंस हेयर ओके ऑट ऑफ फेल टू ऑप्टेन सफिशियंट एंड अप्रोप्रिएट ऑडिट एविडेंस राइटली सेड ओके नाउ दे आर फोर ओपिनियंस राइट सो दे आर फोर ब्लॉग्स इन विच वी हैव टू इनपुट द ओपिनियंस ओके फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल टेल मी what should come here from your current knowledge what should come here there is risk of material misuse statement present in financial statement and effects of which are pervasive so risk of material misuse statement is present in financial statement and the effects of which are pervasive in nature adverse opinion adverse adverse opinion okay i'm just fulfilling uh, this first and then we will understand okay now auditor fails to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence okay and the possible effects of which are pervasive in nature disclaimer disclaimer okay disclaimer now for these two modified modified what about other qualified sir qualified qualified okay and then qualified again right so this matrix is complete first of all right now let us try to understand this in a bit more detail first of all since you all know the answer so i won't be explaining how we have derived adverse how we have derived disclaimer how we have derived qualified because we are uh, anyways going to discuss about it in detail and since you all have answered correctly so there's no need to understand uh, in detail but the point to be noted here is that what when i explain the sentence or when i said the sentence what i said is risk of material misuse statement is present in financial statements and the effects of which are pervasive in nature and the effects of which are pervasive in nature whereas when i said the second sentence auditor fails to obtain sufficient or appropriate audit evidence and the possible effects i added to the word possible here and the possible effects of which are pervasive in nature right so why possible effects has been added possible word has been added since we don't have the information we cannot say for certain that something is there or something is not there or whether it has effect on the financial statement or not right because yeah. we have not identified it right okay can we mention here auditor has not obtained sufficient or appropriate audit evidences can we say, say that can we use that word no sir why not sir because uh, this failure is basically and uh, you know from the management's perspective it is not from the auditor's perspective yes so when if we would be mentioning auditor has failed to, oh, sorry auditor has not obtained sufficient and appropriate audit evidence then what we are saying is we are saying that auditor is not competent right which is not the case because due to some reason auditor has not been able to obtain the evidence so that is why auditor fails to obtain evidence that is the keyword here now based on the sentences of adverse and disclaimer can you frame the sentence for a qualified because it it is fulfilling two blocks right so can you frame the sentence for qualified qualified opinion is to be expressed when rmms is present in financial statements but it is not pervasive okay but it does not have a pervasive effect okay okay but this is not a complete definition of qualified right because you have said for this one what about this one or auditor fails to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidences which are which can possibly which have possible non pervasive effect of, the possible effects of which are not pervasive right yeah am i audible yes sir yes so the possible effects of which are not pervasive right so both the definitions are correct okay the first one was risk of uh, for uh, qualified first one and the second one was qualified second one the conjunction word that we used was or right that if any of the condition is fulfilled we would write it as qualified okay i am sure that i don't need to understand uh, make you understand the difference between make and uh, end and or right now we can move further because with this we have completed the understanding of basic of audit report as well as basic of audit opinions as well now 
we can move to our section a okay so we have spent a good amount of time we have spent good amount of time to understand the basics about the syllabus about the exam pattern about the basic skills that we would use about basics of auditing okay so till then till now the session was good you find it fruitful till now because now we would be entering into the course labors now if you want to discuss anything more than that on the basic please feel free to answer uh, please feel free to ask it right now please tell me sir in case of failure of uh, uh... uh failure to obtain the audit evidence yeah uh, for instance one such case is limitations imposed by the management they are okay. uh, you know showing restraint in terms of sharing the evidence yes yes but yes. what if it is it, it happens due to natural causes will it again form part of disclaimer of opinion so what happens is when we say limitation on a scope right so lim these two facts that is one is limitation of a scope or limitation on a scope and the second one unable to obtain sufficient and or fails to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence are quite different i'll explain you how when we sign the engagement right engagement letter when we sign the engagement letter there are certain scope of audit that is mentioned right in that uh, please be active please say yes or no okay yes sir so, yes sir. yes so that scope is mentioned over there along with that in all engagement letter we would be understanding about that when we would be reading isa 210 which is uh agreeing the terms of audit agreeing to the right? terms of engagement yeah so in that we would be understanding that a mandatory content of the engagement letter is the management's responsibility right now the management's responsibility is regarding providing all information we say that access to all unrestricted access to all individual within the organization right if you remember we say that this yes. is one management's responsibility so limitation of scope is when management is intentionally involving to certain act which is deviating them from their responsibility okay that is right that is the limitation on scope in that case you you must have remember uh, you must be remembering that in that case it is not said that you should issue, issue disclaimer of opinion in that case it is directly uh, it directly says to withdraw from the engagement right or take legal help yes, right to withdraw yes, from sir. the engagement or legal help because the scope the scope of the engagement is getting compromised and if your scope of the engagement is getting compromised then you cannot issue reasonable assurance and that is why you should either withdraw from the engagement or take legal help whereas when we talk about this disclaimer of opinion that is auditor has failed to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidences this is not just on account of management failure to give you the evidence but on account of anything so for example management has said that we own Hundred acres of land in a village. Okay, now since that village is in Karnataka, so all the documents, all the legal documents that are being mentioned, or all the legal documents are in Kannada language. Okay, the regional language. Okay. Uh, please be active. Okay. Yeah. Now, auditor, what auditor has said is, we have tried to ident, we have tried to find a lot of translators who. can transfer from kannada on kannad to english but we haven't found so okay so that is why we are unable uh -huh. to obtain evidences over the title deeds of these particular lands in this case it is not limitation on scope but failure to obtain audit evidence and that is why it would include disclaimer of opinion rather than withdrawing from the engagement on let uh, limitation on scope that is the core difference between limitation on scope and disclaimer of opinion that is there the intention is not to provide intentionally intention is that to not provide audit evidences whereas in case of disclaimer of opinion the scenarios might might not allow you to take evidences that is the main part and that is the main differentiation point understood this so point supposedly if a company yeah, yeah. is not maintaining a certain kind of information or yeah. the system doesn't allow us to extract the required information this will fall into this sufficient and appropriate information yes, not yes, being yes. available yes yes this this would fall under sufficient and appropriate audit evidences this is not limitation on scope until and unless until and unless i'll give you a diplomatic answer here until and unless it is for the very basic point which it should have the report for for example if it is saying that we cannot generate cash and bank balances then that is uh, not appropriate right but if yeah. this but if you have a certain requirement certain customized requirement 
and that cannot be fulfilled, then that would fall under disclaimer of opinion. But if they say that we do not have any uh, list for cash and bank balances, then that would form under uh, limitation limitation on scope. If they cannot provide you anything, if system generated report cannot be provided, that is not limitation on scope. But if they say we cannot provide anything, then that is limitation on scope. Huh. Sir, okay. uh, as highlighted by you, uh, you've given the reference of ISA 210. Yeah. So that is to be done before we sign the engagement letter, right? During the course yeah. of the engagement letter. That is when we discuss the management's responsibility and yes. the auditor's yes. responsibility, etc. Yes. Yes. What if we accept the engagement and during the course of audit, audit there are certain uh, limitations uh, imposed by the management. So in that case as well, we have the option to withdraw or Definitely. we need to find a Definitely, definitely. Disclaimer of opinion. No, no. So when it. we, so when we would be understanding about the international standards on auditing, there would uh, come one standard where we would talk about that if there are limitations on scope. Okay, even during the engagement, sometimes I'll tell you from my practical experience. Sometimes it happens during the conclusion report, uh, conclusion meeting also, that the auditor has been performed. Okay, the client was saying that okay, we will provide you this information be before closure of the audit. Okay, sometimes they say no that. We would be providing you this information. It is not available now. We are arranging it. It would be available with uh, before closing of the audit. Okay. But right, at the right. end of the audit, that information is not provided by the management saying that it cannot be provided. Okay. Now in that case okay. also, auditor has the responsibility, not just an option, but the responsibility to either withdraw from the engagement or take legal help. That's what we should do. It is the responsibility of the auditor, not just an option given to the order. It is the basic responsibility of the order that if there are limitation on the scope, even on the last day of the audit, you should either withdraw from the engagement or you should take legal help. Got it. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Any other basic question, any other uh, uh, question related to your personal experience, your professional experience related to audit? Because after this, we would be entering into the course labors of ACCA AAA. Although we have covered a lot of points here, we would be getting the benefit when we would be understanding international standards on auditing. But for now, anything that you would like to cover, I would be happy to discuss with you. Good to go from my end. Okay. What about others? Same, sir. Good to go. Great. Okay. So now we are entering into section A, which is the regulatory environment. This topic is going to be very theoretical. Okay. So please um, um, bear with me because uh, I cannot give you a lot of logics here, right? Because we would be understanding about the legal structure, which is being followed in United Kingdom. So we would have to read a lot of details and I would request, did you guys get the books? The physical books or the ebook or anything physical books ebooks anything no sir uh, i spoke to the admin guy and he said that uh, because of the g20 summit you know yeah. the lms and all could not be arranged but uh, he will do that shortly so not right now issue. i don't have any access to the uh, books not not an issue so that is not urgently required but from my end i would suggest that when we complete this section if it is regulatory environment okay or even if we do, do not complete it today, but to whatsoever level we move today, I would request you to read it from your end once from book, okay, within this week only, so that you get good idea because there could be a lot of theoretical points which we might not cover, right, as part of the general understanding. So I would request you to please read it because these are the regulatory frameworks of United Kingdom. Although I have covered all the important points that we should be aware about, but I would strongly suggest that you read it once because these are the regulatory frameworks of United Kingdom, right? We are aware about the regulatory framework of India, but we should be aware about international regulatory framework which are being followed in United Kingdom. So I would request you to read it line by line, mention uh, all the important points. If you feel anything to be understood, you please contact me. I will explain it to you, okay? So international regulatory frameworks for audit and assurance services. Our focus for today is going to be this one only. Money laundering and laws and regulations we would be understanding in the next session, which is next week. So our focus for today is going to be international regulatory frameworks for audit and assurance services. And if the time allows, then we might enter into some discussion of money laundering also. So, international regulatory frameworks for audit and assurance. First of all, are we clear that this is a pure theoretical topic? We might not have a logic for everything and we'll just have to read what is given over here and we'll have to understand it. First of all, is that clear? Yes, sir. So, yes. 
yes so please uh, forgive me because i'll have to repeat what is <laughs> written over here i might not give you a lot of logics a lot of examples because this is the regulatory framework but can you please tell me why regulatory frameworks are required in any country not just uk not just india but any country why regulatory frameworks are required what might be the objective of regulatory frameworks in order to make comparison easier and to give a path and a way to do things okay okay uh, can you tell me so to... uh, Yes, please. Do, please. The interest of the stakeholders. Okay, okay. Uh, somebody else was also answering. Yes, sir. So basically, uh, regulatory frameworks are to ensure high level of quality. Uh, okay. and you know, okay. for standard standardizing a particular process, okay. so that okay. there is benchmarking and you know, it it helps comparison and uniformity in the practices. Okay, okay. Understood your point. Um, from my knowledge or from your uh, analysis or understanding of the business globally, can you tell me which country is said to have the uh, most ease of doing business? Oh, sorry, sir. Um, I didn't get you. Yes. So uh, in India, we are focusing on increasing the ease of doing business, right? But as of now, as of now, if we have to name one country which has the easiest way of doing business or where ease of doing business is at its highest can you name that country china sir sorry china uh, okay anything else any other guess okay if you have to start a company in india how many days of investment would it require days as in time to frame a uh, to form to form a company to get all the regulatory environment approvals one week roughly one week one week to one month in some cases right if the in, in business is complex right at least this much time i'll tell you singapore is said to have the most ease of doing business you can start the business in one day test said in the reports that Singapore has the easiest way of doing business. They have the fastest process in arranging your licenses in arranging all your business needs. Did you know that Singapore? No, sir. Yeah. So that is why you will see that a lot of companies are based in Singapore. A lot of startups also are based in either Switzerland, Singapore. Okay. So what we are going to discuss about now is not the laws and regulations. What we are going to discuss about is international regulatory framework, but specific to audit and assurance services. So whatever we are going to discuss about, please be sure that we are going to discuss about it in reference to the audit and assurance services. Now, please tell me that why a regulatory framework is required. You have said that for the comparison, for the standardization process, all this is correct. What if I tell you that the need for regulatory framework is to ensure that there are no illegal activities or all the activities are considered in the legal manner. That is the basic of all for all regulatory framework for all regulatory organization that activity should be conducted in a legal manner. That is lawful manner. Yes, right. Sir. Right. That is the core I basic understand. of all things. So I understand that your all answers are correct. But if we go to the very basic part, it's just to ensure all the regulatory framework, all the regulatory authorities responsibility is just to ensure that all the activities are conducted in the legal or lawful manner. Here, we are going to discuss about the laws and regulations which are framed in United Kingdom or international level for audit and assurance services only. We have already discussed about audit services. We have already discussed about some of the assurance services also. Now, overview of UK regulatory framework. So what we are going to do is overview of you get regulatory framework. We'll just note certain important points. Okay. If you go to the book, there are pages and pages. What I have done is I have read all those pages. I have formed the crisp and I have actually mentioned it here. So I'm sure that when you will be reading the book, you might not find a lot of new points or any new point for that matter. But I would still request you to please go ahead and read the book. Okay. So person carrying out a statutory audit must be approved by the authorities of EU member state. What is EU? European Union. European Union. So any person who is carrying out a statutory audit must be approved by the authorities of European Union, which is EU member states. What might be certain uh, EU member state? One is England. Others? 
France, France. sorry, France, France Germany, France, Fran France, Germany, okay, uh, Switzerland, Portugal, Switzerland, okay, Italy. okay, so these are yes, so whole of Europe, right? So all the major countries of Europe, so all the major countries of Europe are covered under EU. So they have a European Union, okay, and they have certain authority. They have certain authority who must approve any statutory auditor. So after ECC qualification, if you become, can you can you open a firm? Can you uh, do attestation services, or you can only perform job in UK? I believe we can practice as well, sir. Okay, okay. So let's discuss a bit about that, okay? Because that is an interesting topic uh, in itself, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> or audit and assurance is going to be a, a bigger chunk of the ACCA business, right? So when after qualification, after ACCA qualification, qualification, if you want to move abroad, one option is job, right? But a lot of people also practices. So in which country? In all the one eighty plus countries, you can uh, practice also. No, so sir, only in UK, I believe. Okay, so you get job offers in roughly one eighty plus countries, right? One ninety plus countries after ACCA qualification, right? Now, uh, if I have to ask you that in what all countries you can practice, are you aware about that? One answer is UK only. Okay, what about others? Maybe so, Middle East. Middle East. Okay. Okay. And Singapore, I believe they are all Singapore. Okay, okay, okay. So there are six countries. Okay, from my current knowledge, uh, there are six countries where you can practice. Okay, I might not be able to name all the six countries, but but from what I know, UK is there, New Zealand is there, Australia is there. Okay, and in Middle East also, I have seen ACCS practicing. Okay, because a lot of business uh, is there for ACCA. Uh, you can find a lot of Indian chartered accountants also in Middle East, but you will also find a lot of ACCS and US CPAs also in Middle East. So I believe Middle East might be one of those six countries and there are two more. Okay. So you can practice in these six countries. Okay. So when I say that there is a European member states, okay, EU, which is EU member states organization, and it approves all these statutory audit auditors in the country. Okay. Or in the member states now if you want to go ahead and register your practicing firm in uk can you do so first of all yes sir yes you have to approve you have to get approved by the authorities of eu member states right if you understand it from your point of view you will be able to remember it better okay that is why i'm giving you that example okay so imagine a scenario where you have qualified as an acca and now you have decided to move to uk to practice okay to set up attestation services now first of all you must be approved by the authorities of eu member states first of all can you understand this do not try to understand it from the way that person carrying out a statutory audit must be approved just think it from your point of view that if I want to go to UK, set up my own practice, I have to get approved by the authorities of EU member states. First of all, okay, you will be able to understand it better. Is this point clear? First of all, yes. So whatever you are understanding under international regulatory framework, okay, please try to remember it from your point of view. Instead of just reading the theoretical part, the best way of making it more interesting and to increase your uh, memory here for these international regulatory framework is to apply it on yourself. Okay. That would be the hack here. So in UK, in UK, in particularly United Kingdom out of that EU, one part is UK, United Kingdom. This power is given to recognized supervisory body. That is RSB recognized supervisory body. Okay. In India, we talk about which would be called as equivalent to recognized supervisory body for statutory auditors. Can you answer, please? ICAI. ICAI, okay. Okay, so whenever you need a break, please let me know, okay, later on, because I might lose the track of time. So after 10, 15 minutes, I'm planning another break, okay? Yes, please tell me ICI one answer. Okay. So my question is, I'll again repeat the question. It is written here that in UK, 
the power to approve statutory auditors is given to recognized supervisory bodies. There are no names given as of now, but recognized supervisory bodies. That is, there's more than one recognized supervisory body. In India, who is that recognized supervisory body? I think, sir, ICI itself. I, ICI, okay. Have you heard of NAFRA, NFRA? Yes, sir. Yes, NFRA. It is, it is the... Yes, yes, branch please. which regulates some part of the order profession, right? Some part of the order profession. I won't say the exact words, but some part of the order profession, right? So in India, if we have to consider something equivalent to recognized to supervisory body, one answer is ICI because it has the power to qualify chartered accountants, right? To regulate the activities of qualified uh, qualified charter accountants to regulate the activities of aspirants of chartered accountancy course plus it has certain power over creation of accounting standards right over regulation of the profession also but there's one more institution which is called nafra right nafra also has the power to determine the quality of the profession right to determine the uh, regulatory provisions of the profession right so in india if we have to discuss uh, if we have to name something equivalent to recognized supervisory bodies it could be ici also it could be nafra also for the audit profession if we have to say right do you understand this until now yes sir yes so in uk similarly there is recognized supervisory body so like in india there's ici plus one more right Similarly, in UK, there might be more than one. Yeah. Yes, sir. So if you have to uh, guess from your current knowledge that who all could be those recognized supervisory body, what could it be? Recognize, yes, rec recognized supervisory bodies of UK. You have to guess it from your current knowledge, okay, without studying it. ACC, okay, one answer, ACCM. Okay, ACC CPA? is one that can, sorry? CPA. CPA, okay, okay. I won't say it is the correct answer or an incorrect answer. Let's have more answers for now. Okay, ACC is a global qualification, right? Yes, ICWA, sir. ICWA, okay. Uh, let's not get into the exact word, but ICAI of England, okay? England and Wales, right? I think it's called ICAEW, right? Yes, sir. ICAEW. Okay. Yes, ICAEW. Even if it's wrong, it's uh, ICI of England and Wales, right? So, okay, one thing is ACCA, another one is ICAEW. So, you should remember it how I'll tell you how you should remember it. In India, ACC and CS work together, right? There are job opportunities for both, right? Yes. yes Similarly, sir. in UK also, there are more than one recognized supervisory body out of that. One is ACCA, another one is just like in India, there's CA, there is local CA in UK also, ICA, EW members, ICA, EW members, okay? You know what it is called? The, For example, after CA, you get CA uh, prefix, right? After ACCA, you get ACCA suffix, right? Yes, what, is, what is the suffix or prefix for uh, England, local England CS? Because he will need to read a lot of local profiles also, right? So you will be connecting to a lot of people on LinkedIn. You will be connected to a lot of people outside your ECCA uh, slavers also. So that is why you should know about these things. So what is the uh, prefix there? So ACA, FCA? ACA, yes. ACA is there, right? ACA. They call it as associate chartered accountants, right? In India also, we call it associate, but we commonly write CA only. But there, it's compulsory to write ACCA, which is associate chartered accountant. Then there's also BFP. Do you know BFP? No, sir. But I am sure P stands for practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's a business finance professional. Good guess. It's business finance professional. Okay. So all of these are active in United Kingdom. So your main territory is going to be United Kingdom. So you should be aware about all these professions which are going on in United Kingdom, which are the competing pro professions, right? So as of now, what we have understood about is every person who has to enter into statutory audit should be approved by EU authorities, okay? Then in UK, 
this power to approve a statutory audit is given a statutory auditor is given to recognize supervisory body out of that one recognized supervisory body is acca and that is why you get attestation function power or practicing power in uk so wherever recognized supervisory body is acc in what all countries recognized supervisory body is acc you get attestation powers there understood this point yes sir yes so whenever yes, you are confused about which in which countries you can practice either you can google it directly or you can see that in what all countries acc has the recognition power or the recognized supervisory body power okay so that is how you can uh, design uh, you can understand that in what all countries acc has the practicing power now let us read further so rsbs which is recognized statutory uh, supervisory bodies are required by companies act what is the companies act of uk i told you yesterday In India's Companies Act 2013, in UK Companies Act 2006, yeah, it's written also here, right? Okay, so RSBs are required by Companies Act to have rules to ensure that persons eligible for appointment are only considered as company auditor. That is, only people who who are eligible for appointment as company auditors are taken as statutory auditors. That is one requirement. In India, also there's one such requirement. In India also, yes, yes sir. Qualif qualified chartered accountants or a firm holding partners who are qualified chartered accountants. Yes. So in India also, companies act say that who should be an auditor, right? What are the ideal qualifications of an auditor? You remember there is one section one forty three or something which says qualifications and disqualifications of an auditor. Yes, in, sir. In company auditor, right? So similarly, there is one section of that in companies act. There is the reference is also given. Companies Act 2006, Section 1212 to Section 1215. Okay. Now, who are considered as eligible for appointment or qualified chartered accountants? Who are considered as qualified or eligible people for appointment as company auditor or as statutory auditors? There are two categories given. One is individuals holding an appropriate qualification. Why appropriate? What is mentioned over here and not ACCA? Because there are multiple options multiple. other than ACC. Yes, ACC is also there. ICE W member is also there. BFP business finance professional might also be there. Ireland But, Institute of Ireland as well, I think Institute okay. of Chartered Accountants of Ireland. Okay, as of now, I'm not sure about that, so I won't be commenting on that. But yes, there is a higher chance that that might also be an option. Okay. But I'll ensure that I'll uh, check it uh, before our next class, and I'll answer you. Okay, or before uh, concluding today's class, we can actually uh, read about it. Okay, now the more interesting part is the second point here, which is firms controlled by qualified persons. Firms controlled by qualified person. What does this mean? Practices. Sorry. Practices owned by uh, either ACCA or. Other, so like have, yeah, just like yeah. we have partnership firms here, sir, because uh, you know, a company form is, I think, corporate entity form is not allowed uh, just by the companies act. Mm -hmm. Uh, so right. firms controlled by qualified person, as in, you know, it could be partnership firms, just like uh, the structuring is done in. Okay, okay. So I'll tell you uh, the detail. You all are correct, okay. But I'll tell you a little bit more about it, okay. The interpretation part of it, okay. So what happened was. it says that rsbs that is recognized statutory uh, supervisory bodies are required by companies act of uk to hire only or to appoint only eligible person as company auditor okay that acca which means that acca institution also has to follow certain regulations of the companies act of uk before appointing any person as as a company auditor right first of all the meaning is clear up till now yes sir now yes. company auditor might be two class of people one is individual person an individual person could also be a company auditor right the second class is the firm the audit firm right in this case for example in in india me as ca supreet agrawal could be the uh, could be the statutory auditor of a company on the other hand if i create a firm with all of you and we create a firm we create a merge firm so our firm could be the auditor of that company first of all understand understood till here yes, yes sir, sir. now first point is very clear individuals holding an appropriate qualification that is very clear but the second point has uh, uh, requires little interpretation it is saying that firms controlled by qualified person that is audit those firms could also be appointed as the statutory auditor which are controlled by the qualified person a qualified person in this case might be acca might be business finance professional might be acca right 
so controlled by what if the staffs are not qualified what if the staffs are not qualified it's all right sir it's okay yeah so imagine a scenario where you four or five people are qualifying acc okay you all have decided to uh, create a partnership firm in uk for the audit practice okay now one of you is the controller of that firm okay one of you is the controller of that firm who actually controls managing partner or so okay who actually controls the firm okay now that person is qualified while others are not will that work can that firm could also be appointed as the statutory auditor yes sir yes so you do not need to think it that way that uh, even if the staffs are not qualified we cannot be appointed as an auditor the controller of the firm just the main person should be qualified okay so is there a specification for the control part like what will concise as control no no as of now no 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 just the basic control that is you have the ability to derive the uh, decision making or to do the decision making within an organization just the general interpretation okay okay sir. yes so as of now what we have understood about is every person who should be who would be conducting statutory audit uh, who would be conducting statutory audit must be approved by authorities of eu member states in uk it has been delegated to recognize supervisory body which is rsb acc is one rsb and rsbs require rsbs are required by companies act to hire two kind of uh, people as an company auditor as a company auditor number one individuals who are appropriately qualified and second one firms which are controlled by the qualified personnel okay now let us move further there's one council which is financial reporting council which is frc financial reporting council if we do not read anything which is given on the slide what can we understand from the financial reporting council word what would be its role financial reporting council financial report reporting work. report uh, rules for the financial reporting financial reporting financial reporting is an accounting right when we say financial reporting it's basically accounting right but here when we go for reporting financial reporting it's not just financial reporting although the name suggests financial reporting council but it also includes governance what do we mean by corporate governance maintaining transparency okay we'll learn about it a bit later on but as of now what we understand is there is one institution called financial reporting council okay in united kingdom which oversees some of the items okay but before moving further it's again being more than one hour would you like to take 5 minutes break because after this we might not be able to take break for roughly more than half an hour yeah sure sir yeah so let's take 5 minutes break and then we will resume with financial reporting council and then we would be reading further okay
Hello, so are we there? Yes, okay. ओके थैंक यू शालदिया थैंक यू सिद्धार्थ जस्ट वेटिंग फॉर दस टू ज्वाइन थैंक यू क्वी थैंक यू हसीब ओके सो नाउ वी कैन स्टार्ट ओके सो फिनेंशियल रिपोर्टिंग काउंसिल वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट फिनेंशियल रिपोर्टिंग काउंसिल एज ऑफ नाउ वी हैव डिस्कस्ड अबाउट बेसिक्स ऑफ रेगुलेटरी फ्रेमवर्क नाउ वी हैव एंटर इन द डिस्कशन of one particular organization or institution which is financial reporting council as of ever, as of now we have discussed that the role and responsibility of financial reporting council is not just to monitor financial reporting but also corporate governance we would be understanding about corporate governance in detail just after this particular point so there is one frc board which is financial reporting council board board as in it has certain members and there are two committees of frc board number one codes and standards committee and number two is conduct committee this is really uh, theoretical so we'll just have to read it we'll just have to understand it then we can move forward so codes and standards committee and conduct committee when we say or when we talk about codes and standards committee it is responsible for actuarial policy that is what would be the actuarial discount rates for the year and also audit and assurance also corporate governance also and accounting and reporting policy also when we talk about the conduct committee it is responsible for audit quality review corporate reporting review professional discipline professional oversight and supervisory inquiries can you suggest me a way if we have to understand this and if we have to remember these two committees the functions of these two committees how can we remember so if after one week if we have to say that these are two committees of frc board and it is responsible for so and so how can we remember that can you suggest me some way you so codes and standards committee it seems more like they are uh, taking decisions regarding how to do the policies rules regulations okay. the guidelines it's standardization basically right if we have yeah. to summarize it into one word it is basically uh, focusing on a standardization of the profession that what are the actuarial policy what is the audit and assurance policy what should be the uh, form of go corporate governance and also when we talk about conduct committee there more like how to conduct uh, yourself 
more like nothing. review more like review and disciplinary committee right more like review and disciplinary committee so when we say codes and standards committee you focus on standardization when you say when you talk about conduct committee it is more on review and disciplinary disciplinary actions okay so whenever you get confused you can use these two uh, words and then you can frame your answer understood this point first of all yes so nothing new to discuss here nothing technical to discuss here that is why we are moving forward so when we move forward there are certain rules of frc board which is mentioned here again these are very generalized ones we can just read it and we'll get to understand the meaning of certain keywords as and when we progress with the syllabus although i'll give you the brief idea about the technical terms but we'll get to know a bit more detail or a lot more detail when we move forward with our syllabus so to set high standards of corporate governance we'll get to know about corporate governance just after a few slides this is about corporate governance okay so that is why i'm not throwing much light on corporate governance for now for now you can understand that corporate governance is the system by which an entity is managed okay to set high standards for corporate governance so just like we said for frc board there are two committees the motive of one committee is to set a standardization and the motive of second committee is to review and set the disciplinary action so definitely the role would also consist that only these two three aspects only correct yes yes sir yes so that is why the first role is to set high standards that is focused on standardization second one is also focused on standardization that is to set high standards for corporate reporting one is corporate governance another one is corporate reporting and actuarial practice then the third one is to monitor and enforce accounting and auditing standards that is what you are doing is you are reviewing right then to oversee regulatory activities that is disciplinary actions and then to operate independent disciplinary arrangements so if you focus on these three words that is standardization review and disciplinary actions you will be able to uh, quote the role of frc board also these uh, this would never be asked directly in the examination understood this point yes sir yes um, i personally feel that we do not need to understand uh, anything further for frc but if you want to uh, understand anything i would be happy to answer please ask your questions if you have any uh no if you have... as of now sorry 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 please sir no questions as of now sir no questions as of now okay because this is very uh, critical this is a very uh, quick uh, frc uh, so this is just a short topic we do not need to understand uh, in a lot more detail uh, it just talks about uh, certain committees and certain roles which we have discussed about right now international standards setting we discussed about all the standards right isa this is one very critical topic okay because not from the exam point of view but from the understanding point of view that you should know about it and you might use it as a reference in your examinations okay so we have understood about a lot more standards right for example is international standards on auditing what else what else yes re uh, re for review right we can answer yeah. it that way now for review engagements right related for, services for related services right okay yes and assurance services for assurance services right uh, uh, there was one more i'm forgetting the name there was one more for quality management also right for quality management also we discussed about so there are a lot of these standards but did we ever understand till now in these two lectures did we understand that who actually sets these standards who who actually creates this standard these standards did we discuss that no sir no so that is our next slide that is who or which organization is responsible to set these standards because as of now what we have understood about is that the main part of syllabus is divided into two parts one is international standards on auditing and the second one is code of ethics right and both these things are designed by the same institution which is ifac which is international federation of accountants you must have definitely heard of it even in the chartered accountancy course indian chartered accountancy course right yes sir references were there in uh, professional ethics i think definitely references were there in professional ethics also when we talked about isba code right international ethics standards board for accountants we talk about isba codes when we talked about isba codes there was reference which is given to ifac which is international federation of accountants international federation of accountants creates 
or designs international standards also and code of ethics also but they have different committees definitely there would be separate committees for uh, accounting standards and auditing standards so there are two kinds of committees can you see on the screen yes sir there are two committees number one is iaasb which is international auditing and assurance standards board i would suggest that you please remember the name okay so for auditing and assurance standards that is accounting and auditing uh, standards there is one one uh, international auditing and assurance standards and for code of ethics there is different which is isba i e s a b okay who sets the accounting standards this is for auditing and assurance standards right who sets the accounting standards they are i they are ifrs right ifrs yes ifrs so who sets the ifrs who designs the ifrs international accounting standards board international accounting standards board right international accounting standards board this is not part of the syllabus i just asked it as a quick reference but right answer international accounting standards board so you do not need to con uh, get confused about these two three uh, committees because these are very critical to our syllabus okay so auditing standards created by whom international auditing and assurance standards board that is it is specific for auditing industry only okay auditing standards only so all kinds of auditing standards whether it is for isa whether it is for quality management whether whether it is for review engagement whether it is for related services whether it is for assurance engagements all of these auditing standards are created by international auditing and assurance standard board which is iaasb first of all is it clear yes sir right and whenever we talk about any code of ethics international code of ethics for professional accountants it would be created by one organization which is international ethics standards board for accountants okay or these two these two organization these two committees comes under ifsc which is international federation of accountants only this is also very basic but, but very critical first of all is it clear if there would be any doubts any queries any discussion points i would be happy to discuss about them right now because this is very critical So does IFAC comes under FRC or this is a separate uh, chapter? This is a separate. This is a separate topic. FRC was very quick. Okay, FRC is just UK. So you can see UK independent regulator. Okay, so this is specifically for UK FRC. All right, all right, all right. FRC is just for UK. Just a small committee or uh, just a small board in UK which just talks about standard setting and regulating the profession in UK. But this international standards or IFSC International Federation of Accountant is fully different. It's applicable all over the world. That is why you see some instances in India also. That is when you read about professional ethics for even for Indian Chartered Accountants, you get reference of ISBA code, which is International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. Right, right, sir. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? We, I would be happy to answer. And sir, I think recently, uh, uh, you know, in the pursuit of convergence with the international uh, auditing standards only, the Indian standards were also revised. I think you know, Def back in two thousand seven, eight. Definitely, so definitely, definitely. So, uh, I would uh give you some specific references. So, uh. If we go for the uh, India's, okay, so India's are uh, exact replica of IFRS, okay, with certain carbon and carve outs, which are roughly four or five carbon carve outs only, right? But they are exact replica of uh, IFRS, IFRS with certain right, so. yes, with certain changes, right? So the biggest impact of it was seen in uh, depreciation or fixed asset related. Initially, it was uh, I gap, which was I gap ten for fixed assets, right? Then IFRS when from taking reference from IAS or IFRS, India sixteen was created, which is property plan and equipment, right? So right. after that, what happened was I'll give you one story here. So what happened was even if you refer to the I gap now, okay, if you even if you go back to I gap ten now, okay, which is the old standard of India, okay, I gap, which is still applicable to certain companies, you will see revised word written over there, right? right even if you go for i gap 37 which is provision maybe okay or any number which is for provision you will see revised word over written over there whenever you will refer to any of the auditing standards also of india you will see the word revised written over there that word revised mean that it has been 
matched with the international standards that revised was stands for that only in all the accounting standards and auditing standards in india right sir okay so whenever revised word is written it is not just that it has been revised that revised word also says that it has been revised as per the international standards so wherever so there are certain standards where you will not see the word revised written over there because they are not 100% replica of the international standards understood okay uh, any other thing that we need to discuss so we also get that revised like when we were going through the book we were seeing isa revised so since yeah. these are already international based so what are they being revised against no 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 so i'll tell you uh, the revised the explanation for the revised word that i was giving it was specifically for india Oh, so the, okay, okay, yeah. okay. So the question that was uh, uh, going on was for India, the reference of India to the international standards. Now, when you say the revised word for IESA, it is continuously revised based on the ongoing industry trends, right? Mm -hmm. Amendments. Yes, amendments, right? Okay, okay, cool, sir. Okay. Any other point? Uh, I think that is what one of the functions of the uh, regulatory committee and the IFAC is, you know. since to monitor the industrial changes and revise the standards as per definitely. the requirement definitely so that is why i have created this chart in such a format that it clearly would show later on to you uh, later on also that ifsc controls iaasb as well as isba code also so that you get a brief reference that these two bodies iaasb and isba both comes under ifsc only that is why i have created this chart instead of writing it So you all are aware that I'll be sharing these PPTs with you, right? Yes, sir. Yes. So when I'll be sharing these PPTs with you, I've created it in such a format that whenever uh, there would be certain crucial information like this, I would be creating separate charts for it for ease of reference later on also. Okay. Right. So thank you. Yes. Plus you have my WhatsApp number on the group also, so you can feel free to text any time for any of the queries or any of the practical queries also. Not an issue. Okay. Oh, uh, sir, just one thing. Yeah. If we can get these PPTs beforehand, like before the classes, it would help because there are so many things that we discuss in the class which are not exactly in the PPT. It would help if we can just update the PPT on our own, as per our understanding, whatever has been discussed during the class and all that. Okay. Uh, so uh, you're talking in that sense that I should share the PPTs before, so that whenever uh, we are conducting the class, you are able to create notes on the PPTs. Exactly. That... Exactly. Just the uh, information that are being discussed within the class that we won't be able to get in the book or in the notes itself. Okay. Okay. Understood your point. I'll have to check it because as of now, what I have agreed uh, with VGLD is that I would be sharing the PPTs right after the session. Yeah, yeah. That is how this normally works. Because, but what yeah. is happening is because this is a very theoretical subject. Yeah. There's a lot of discussions in between that is happening, and a lot okay. of understanding that we gain during the class. But okay. it becomes difficult to like recapture it afterwards. Understood. Understood. From my end, I could do it. Not an issue. Uh, I would just like to understand here that what would be your expectation? Uh, should I share? Uh, for example, the class would be conducted. The next class would be conducted on next Saturday from six p.m. Right. Yeah. So. by when would you expect the ppts because sometimes what happens is i end up creating the ppts by the saturday only right so i there might be certain scenarios where i'll be creating the ppts up to saturday say 2 pm yeah just before the class i, I mean it's just class, that so. we need something that we can write a point okay, okay we understood okay, okay. this and that so you you will also create the digital copy only right you don't yeah, need yeah, to yeah. get the print out of it or anything no 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 digital copy. okay this will work okay okay then then we can do it not an issue even if uh, it is not shared before the class what you can do is you can just remind me during the class that you share it first of all so that we can uh, start taking the notes okay yeah, so that is perfect. Not, perfect that is not an issue even if i do not share it by any chance you can just remind me bef before starting the class that you share it for now and if there would be any changes i'll let you know sure sure That's that would be, that would be perfect right perfect. okay thank you so much sir great great okay so uh, first of all in international standard setting iss we have discussed about that how international standards are set they are set by ifsc but under certain specific committees or boards of I ifsc or ifac which is iaasb and isba okay now we are moving forward so this is per public oversight internationally when we say public oversight what do we mean by it 
Have you heard of PCAOB? PCAOB? There are certain PCAOB audits conducted in India. PCAOB audits. Have you heard of it? No, PC, PCOB. Uh, have you heard of SOX audit? SOX audit? Yes, sir. Right? American based internal internal control audit. Roughly. If yes, we sir. have to say frame a general yes, understanding, sir. it's the internal control audit of American based companies. There are certain specific princ principles which are called as SOX principles that are being created in America uh, or USA and that are being audited from here. So we call we generally call it as SOX audit, right? In India. Similarly, when we audit the public companies of USA from India, you must have seen Deloitte USI, right? Yeah. You must have heard so. of Deloitte USI or PwC SDC or KPMG GDS, right? So all these companies through their offshore offices in India provide services to the US-based clients, right? Majorly to the US-based clients, sometimes internationally also, but majorly to the US-based clients, okay? Now, these companies, why there's a separate office for these companies? Why not to merge it with Indian practice and create a separate team? Have you uh, thought about it? That why to create a separate office for Deloitte USI? And why not merge for it with agreement India? purposes? For agreement purposes, okay, one thing. And jurisdictions? Jurisdictions, okay, one thing. But both are working from India only, right? You would be seeing that, uh, for example, in a city called Gurgaon or in a city called Pune, Deloitte office is there, Deloitte USI office is also there, yeah. right? Sometimes just beside each other. So I've, I've pondered over this point, but I, I couldn't find an answer. Okay, so I'll give you one answer, okay? This answer is not 100% for uh, applicable to Deloitte, for example, but this is the basic structure, okay? So what happens is when Delo Deloitte USI enters into a contract with the client, these clients are generally US-based clients, right? Now, what happens, uh, please be active, okay? Because uh, sometimes what happens yeah. is in the uh, live session, what happens is, for example, my mic is mu mute or you are not able to understand. So you should just say yes or no, okay? Whenever the critical point is going on. So uh, for this point, for Deloitte USI, okay? What happens is they enter into an agreement with the USI uh, for the US clients, which is US-based clients. Generally, there are they are listed clients, okay? They are very big clients of US, okay? So generally, they are listed clients in NASDAQ. Now, when they are listed or when they are bigger companies in USA, there's one board, which is PCAOB board, which regulates the audit of these companies. Okay. Okay. And every single entity which is involved into the audit of these PCAOB regulated companies have to get certain right. specific registrations. There are certain specific reservations. There are certain specific trainings which are required. To be done for all staff okay there are certain regulatory principles which needs to be followed by these firms so if deloitte india would accept such an assignment then all of the employees of deloitte india would be uh subject to those requirements which PCA. would involve, yes which would be huge cost huge irrelevant cost i would say yeah. and that is why they create a separate office so it's for basically for better personal management Definitely, definitely better personal management. That is why you will see Deloitte USI guys getting a lot of training. Okay. Uh, they'll be going to a lot of training sessions, which are generally not given to Indian guys. Okay. You will also see that Deloitte USI has a little bit more package also. Okay. Because all of these are very regulated and the Indian practice, if we merge it with the Indian practice, we cannot afford to have this bigger regulated market in India. And that is why they create separate offices. Okay. Because of this PCOB, majorly, not just the exact reason, but one reason is PCOB also. Okay. So I talked about PCOB, which is based off USA. Now, what we are talking about the international form of PCOB, which is public oversight internationally. So there's one board, public interest oversight board. Okay. Public interest oversight board. What can we uh, guess from the name public interest oversight board? A board that looks forward for the public interest, listed Which companies. Looks forward for the public interest, okay. Not just for listed company, but any public interest. Can we say that any public interest? So, yeah. for example, IFAC is working efficiently or not? It is substantially interested. So, 
yes so for example if ifac is working efficiently or not or any of these committees which is international auditing and assurance standards board is uh, revising the standards properly or not whether ethical standards are created and revised properly or not right so there must be one board which would oversee all of these functions right so that board is called as public interest oversight board first of all let's understand this there's one more committee which is called as committee of european auditing oversight board this is specifically for U european regions this is not international this is for european regions okay but the function is same first of all do we understand this yes, yes sir. so there are two boards public interest oversight board which is internationally applicable then committee of european audit auditing oversight bodies which is ca ceaob this is specifically for european union okay but the role is almost similar so that is why i have just mentioned three roles one is monitoring the standard setting bodies who are the standard setting bodies ifac iasb and isba yes, okay this is for public interest oversight board for european if there are any other standard setting bodies that would also form part of this caob okay so any standard body standard setting body comes under their purview okay then Understood. overseeing the no nomination process of membership of these board i said that for ia aasb and isba there are certain members of the board so say 10 people who are members of the board right so nomination of these members who why how these members would be appointed that also requires a lot of uh, process orientation so that would also be oversight by these piob internationally and caob for european states okay Understood, sir and since this piob which is public interest oversight board is international so whenever the cooperation would be required from national oversight board then that would also be conducted so for example for european states piob and caob would have to work together right in india what is the public interest oversight board can you name one example there are multiple what can you name one example public interest oversight board which might take guidance from piob there's one institution in india which might take guidance from piob which is public interest oversight board sebi sebi yes definitely so sebi has the in uh, sebi has the responsibility regarding public interest right in india so they might take guidance or they might work in collaboration with public interest oversight board internationally this is again a very small topic not to worry about it a bit theoretical but i just gave you the reference for it so whenever it is getting very theoretical i'm just giving you one quick hack so for example for this one you don't need to remember separately for piob and caob what you can remember is that there are two institution one is applicable internationally another one is applicable just for european states the role is similar to monitor the standard setting bodies in case of any conflict between piob and caob uh, the organizations are supposed to go with piob um i would say that although this point is not covered as part of the syllabus or as part of any of the guidance notes also okay so this would be open for interpretation on a case to case basis there are certain items which are open for interpretation on a case to case basis right so this would also be open for interpretation on a case to case basis but in my professional opinion if you ask the general law or the general interpretation rule of the law is that specific prevails over general rule right mm -hmm. so yeah. this piob is general rule for international clients right for international uh, for international bodies whereas if you go for the european states the conflict is in european state then definitely the rules framed by committee of european auditing oversight bo bodies should prevail because these are specific to europe hmm okay right? so similarly okay. if there's a conflict between sebi rules and piob rules in india we are supposed to follow sebi rules because okay. that that are specific so matter of jurisdiction i believe specific definitely. jurisdiction definitely matter of jurisdiction but generally if i say internationally the, the, this interpretation rule works that specific prevails over general rule so in india if we see sebi rule prevails over piob rule so for example if you are the cfo of a company okay you have got two notices number one notice is from sebi okay that you have not regulated or you have not followed some of our requirements and the another one for the same issue is with piob and they have conflicting points okay so for example pib requires you to have two members okay in certain committee whereas sebi requires you to have three members what would you do follow sebi 
follow sebi so that is the general interpretation rule although notices are from both but you will go for the safe side you will say that okay the specific prevails over general that is we will follow the sebi rule and we'll ask sebi to uh, talk with piob okay yes so that would be the interpretation from in my pro professional opinion all the that is not written over anywhere uh, that is specifically we should do this but in my professional opinion that should be done cool sir thank you okay yeah any so other for point for uk c c a o b is the primary jurisdiction right yes definitely for european states for all european states not just U uk uh, c e a o b would be the primary jurisdiction all right any other point to discuss for now Oh, sir, just one more thing. Yes, yes, Deb. please go ahead. PIOB, uh, it is controlling both accounting and auditing or just the auditing aspect? Uh, sorry, can you please repeat your question? I didn't understand it. So, uh, CEAOP, uh, okay, yes. they are mentioning, they are focusing specifically on auditing oversight, right? Yeah. PIOB, on the other hand, are they focusing on both accounting bodies or just the auditing bodies? No, no, no. All these are standard setting bodies. So any standard setting body, any uh -huh. standard setting body, because these are related to public interest, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'll just give you uh, one kind of funny explanation for that. Okay. So uh, this is supposed to be funny, just a lighthead uh, explanation of it. So for example, tomorrow, some fraud happens due to accounting standard and not the auditing standard. Okay. Due to some lack in the accounting standard, not the auditing standard. Can public interest oversight board say that, okay, since it was accounting standard uh, violation, so we didn't follow upon it? <laughs> yeah. <Right? okay. laughs> yeah. So they cannot say that, right? They they have the responsibility to protect public interest, whether it is due to accounting standard or auditing standard or any of the accounting mm -hmm. setting standard or, or any of the standard setting body. So they are supposed to regulate all the standard setting body. Right. That, that, okay. So they, they cannot held up their hand by saying that okay, since it was accounting standard, so we didn't look <laughs> into it. Right? Yeah. Okay, sir. That that is one way of understanding it. Okay. So that is why what I'm doing is, for example, for this one also, or if we go for financial reporting council also, I'm just giving you the overall understanding of it with some brief differentiation point that you should be aware about. Right. For example, for FRC, I could have said you, I could have said to remember all six points for role of FRC, but I gave you some shortcuts, right? You can understand that it is for a standardization. You can understand that it is for review and then you can understand that it is for disciplinary reaction. Now you can frame your own sentences, right? So that is how I'm, I'll be giving you hacks for every single point, wherever required. Understood this point? Yes. That's any, any other question for now? Most. Okay, so now we are entering into um, a little new topic, uh, although part of the same heading, but the theme of the topic would, sorry, the theme of the topic would change. We are entering to corporate governance. For now, can you please tell me, since a lot of you are chartered accountants, Indian chartered accountants, can you tell me where did you learn about corporate governance till now? Companies Act. Companies Act, corporate governance. Did you uh, learn about corporate governance there? Ethics, part of ethics. Ethics, okay, okay. Okay, see what happens is corporate governance. Uh, if I ask a lot of, not you guys, but from my general understanding, if I ask a lot of CA final students, okay, or CA intermediate students, CA intermediate students are really uh, young, so I might not name them, but if I ask CA final students, okay, who are going to appear for CA final. And if I ask them the meaning of corporate governance, a lot of them don't know about it, that what is corporate governance. When I was a team leader in KPMG also, a lot of professional qualified accountants didn't know about corporate governance. You know why, why uh, is it so, or what is the reason for that? Why do... Sir, sir I think it is uh, connected with uh, SEBI regulations, LODR yes. or... Yes, SEBI reg So, you know why people do not gain confidence on uh, corporate governance? It's very natural, okay? You guys know a lot from your answers. I can understand that you guys are giving the right references. But if I ask a CA finalist, okay, who has studied about all of, all of these things, you guys are learned people because you have worked, right? But if I ask the CA finalist or the qualified charter accountant who has not worked, he or she is not sure about corporate governance. What do we mean by corporate governance? You know, what is the reason? 
most of the students at ca final level they leave lodr topics <laughs> <laughs> okay that is one reason that that is one good reason yes because it is asked for say five marks only so they leave it right i understand that reason then i'll tell you one reason practical experience is not that practical experience not there one good reason yes because in all of the articleship experience we do not get corporate governance experience right one good point because that is majorly reserved in india specifically that is majorly reserved for company secretaries for example right yes sir and yeah. most of the students they uh, they need not be from big fours you know so their they exposure need not is be also from in definitely not non listed entities definitely small... definitely this one uh, thing which is recently introduced which is secretarial audit have you heard of it secretarial audit has recently been introduced roughly 3 4 years back secretarial audit no sir no so what happened is um, all listed companies okay i'm just taking reference of all listed companies for now all listed companies have to get their statutory audit right all private limited companies for that matter i know that but for now i'm taking the reference of listed companies they have to get their statutory audit done right yes sir a lot of them have to get their internal audit also done if they uh, cross certain limits right no no limits yes sir yes certain limits internal audit sometimes cost audit also right now companies act have have come come up with a new audit which is secretarial audit so what they realized was even after applying or even after requiring from the independent auditor independent statutory auditor to report on a lot of corporate governance requirement the requirement is not getting fulfilled and there are frauds identified okay so what they did was they identified new kind of or they introduced new kind of audit which is secretarial audit which is mandatory for all listed companies okay so they have to get one secretarial audit done every year which is reserved for whom can you guess yes cs which is reserved for company secretaries for example statutory audit is reserved for chartered accountants similarly secretarial audit is reserved for company secretaries okay so all practicing company secretaries have got one assignment of listed companies which is for the secretarial audit and the overall responsibility of those secretarial audit is simple you have to report on the corporate governance of the company that is appointment of directors is appropriate or not remuneration given to directors are appropriate or not whether all the requirements of company act is getting fulfilled or not and that is how Understood. and that is how the corporate governance has been uplifted in india at least in india for now okay so now what we are going to study about is corporate governance and i'll give you the answer now a lot of qualified chartered accountants or at least the ca finals are not confident about corporate governance because it has been scattered into multiple places some part of it is in lodr some part of it is in ca final audit some part of it is in professional ethics some part of it is in law some part of it is in even in strategic management some part of it is in even in business communication of ca foundation you, if you remember business writing notices writing and all right 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 sir yeah so it is it is scattered over all the places because it is a very big topic and that is why a lot of people are not very confident about corporate governance as a topic because they generally don't understand it by the name of corporate governance for example in foundation time also the notices that you are writing are part of corporate governance right in ca uh, in ca ipcc the strategic management that you are learning about how to manage a company that is also part of corporate governance in ca final if we talk about the professional ethics in professional ethics some part of it is corporate governance in law also you get certain references for corporate governance like corporate social responsibility like director responsibility st statement all these are part of corporate governance only but it is not taught with the name of corporate governance and that is why students are mostly confused about it understood this point first of all yes sir so, so now what we are going to do is since this topic is very scattered we will be br bringing it together although we have little time left with us some 10 15 minutes so what we'll do is we'll learn basics of corporate governance and then we will move forward okay so instead of going into very detail we'll be understanding basics of corporate governance and when we would resume our session the next session on next saturday we would be taking it into full flow so for now we'll just be understanding about the basics of it okay so now yes. our motive is not going to be to have expert knowledge on corporate governance or to discuss any particular part of corporate governance our motive is just going to be like that we are going to discuss certain basic points of corporate governance and frame a detailed uh, frame an overall understanding okay so first of all the definition of corporate governance is that corporate governance is a system 
it's a system first of all okay? it's not a process it's not an element it's not anything else it's a system you have to write this word it's a system by which an organization is directed and controlled you remember those five principles which you used to which we used to study in a business sorry yeah please say somebody was saying something Oh, nothing, sir. Okay, sorry. So, uh, you remember those five uh, principles that we used to study about in uh, class 11th business studies, planning something? Yes, sir. Planning, controlling, monitoring, uh, improving. Okay. Uh, planning, staffing, directing, controlling. Remember? Yes, planning, sir. directing, or planning, staffing, organizing, directing, controlling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What mm -hmm. about others? Remember these five points? No, sir. I don't remember. Okay. So what happens is in class 11th, when we study business management subject, right? Business studies, this subject was there, right? Do you remember that? The subject was there, business studies, class 11th commerce. Sir, I've come from science background. Okay. Not an issue then. Whosoever would be commerce, there is one subject called business studies. Okay. Under that, we learn about five points, which is essential of any business, which is planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. So planning is done by the top level management. Okay. Planning is done. Organizing, that is how to actually perform those functions which are decided at planning is again done by top level management. Staffing is done by top level management. When we come to directing and controlling, directing and controlling, that has to be governed by certain principles. Planning might be different for every organization, right? Yes, sir. Planning might be different for every organization. There might be different principles that might be followed for planning. How to organize that planning? How to actually achieve that planning? The planning for that or the execution for that also depends on the organization based yeah. on there shouldn't be any standardization, right? Every organization has its own plans. Mm -hmm. When we talk yes, about sir. staffing, that what which kind of people to hire, right? How much compensation to give them? That is also depending on the customization of the organization. That what all compensation, what all kinds of people to hire, right? A government as government, we cannot comment on that. As regulatory bodies, we cannot comment on that, right? But imagine a scenario where the organization has decided that the working hours in a company is not going to be eight hours; it's going to be twenty-four hours for every employee. It will require control from the government it and the legislations. The yeah, or uh, the uh, the top level people of the government uh, of the company has said that we wouldn't be paying you any salary. We will be just giving you the experience letter. Okay, we'll get the work from you for eight hours a day. We won't be paying you anything for years, not just for one or two months as an internship, but for years. You are my employee, but I won't be paying you anything. Can that be done? No, no. No, right. So these two things, which is directing the activities of the organization, that is how the organization is directed and how the organization is controlled. They require strict regulations. They require certain guidances also that how an organization should be directed and controlled. In planning, you do not require that. In organizing, you do not require that. In staffing, you do not require that because that all are the personal decisions of an organization, right? But when you move towards directing and controlling, if you allow the organization to take their personal decision, they'll make a they'll make it very very bad kind of management, right? And that is why the strict regulations are required as far as the management or directing and controlling of the organization goes, and that is why. It is said that corporate governance is a system by which an organization is directed and controlled, not other three words. Understood this point first of all? Yes, sir. Yes? System by which companies are directed and controlled. Uh, would you remember this definition for now? Yeah. Yeah, it's not difficult. You just need to mention these three words. System, directed, and controlled. Control. In this thing I would suggest that you do not change the definition, you do not change the keywords because it would change the meaning of it. Okay, so I'm not telling you to mug it up, but I'm telling you to understand the importance of these three words and make sure that you write these three words only if asked because using any other word would change the meaning of it. Okay. So can you quickly summarize it once again? I 
definitely definitely else. not an issue not an issue i was anyways about to summarize it so i'll just do it okay so what happens is in case of corporate governance okay in case of corporate governance generally what we mean by corporate governance governance is related to government right that means to regulate something to control something correct so that what we are saying is corporate governance is a system first of all okay corporate governance it's a structure it's a system right now we have to decide that it is a system for what okay it is a system for what so there are majorly five activities which are conducted by any organization or by the top level management of any organization okay are you listening yes sir yes sir yeah so there are five types of activities which are generally conducted by the top level management of any organization number one planning planning the activities of the organization right number two organizing that is how to execute that plan right number three to staff that is to hire the people to give them compensation and all right yes fourth one is directing that is to ensure that whatever we decided is executing or not and then controlling that regulate uh, making changes regularly or to update with latest technologies okay now what happened was that government decided that we should put certain regulations can they put regulations on planning of a company no sir. no sir they cannot put regulations on planning of the company that you cannot plan this they cannot do so right i'm just explaining you from a very practical point of view okay so government cannot say to a company that okay we are putting regulations on your planning that whatever you plan you should report to us first they cannot do so right second yes they said that howsoever you are planning to execute that plan you should report to us first government cannot do so right so there couldn't be any controls on planning or organizing is do, is that understood first of all yes sir now on staffing the government has said that we will decide whom you can uh, give uh, employment to what all salary you can give and all that thing can government put regulations on staffing not practical not practical right so these three are out planning planning organizing and staffing are out now we are left with two which is directing and controlling now government has said that we would put a strict control over how you are managing the organization as in whether you are giving proper leave to the employees or not whether you are paying leave encashment to them or not whether you are providing appropriate work culture or not we are putting restrictions on that or we are putting reservations on that can government do so yes sir yes so that seems more practical right that gov uh, that government can enter into this that whether you are providing proper workstation to the employees or not whether you are depositing their tax or not whether you are fulfilling all the legal requirements or not and that is why the corporate governance corporate governance is a system which is framed by government only but it is specifically for directing and controlling of the functions of the organization right so that no illegal function is being conducted on the employees of a company so system by which companies are directed and controlled did you understand this first of all understood yes, so the corporate governance you have to write these three words only that is it is a system to decide how the organization would be directed and controlled these three words you can change the other words you can change the other sentence but these three words should come i'm not telling you to mug it up what i'm telling you or what i'm asking from you is to understand the importance of these words and then write these words only okay so sir like uh, it is unethical for a company to observe every single activity of any employee in order yeah. to control or manage the productivity right yeah. so this will also form part of corporate government governance see i'll tell you uh, although this is not written as part of the corporate governance okay but let us again take one more funny example for this one okay so uh, if i am working at an organization okay say xyz limited let's not name any company i am working at xyz limited okay now i have privacy issues okay so for example i have a chamber i have a private chamber in which hidden camera has been installed by the company hmm. okay now i have uh, decided to put up a case against the company okay who would be responsible from the company's point of view uh, who will be responsible for what managing director sir who who would be responsible for this kind of an action my immediate manager or the manager uh, or, or the management uh, managing director of the company whom would i put up a case so i'll explain the again i'll explain the scenario again okay i have a private chamber okay okay there are two cameras understood this first of all that is why i'm so, that is why i'm asking you to answer or yes sir or okay okay so that 
you are i am able to understand whether you are understanding the case properly or not okay so i have a chamber at xyz company okay there are two cameras one is the cctv camera which i know that it has been installed on my chamber okay yeah. there's second camera which is the hidden camera mm -hmm. okay i did not know about it one day i found out that there's a hidden camera on my chamber okay mm -hmm. What I did was I reported it to the authorities or, or I put up a legal case against my X, X, XYZ company. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the notice has been uh, sent to XYZ company. Okay. Who would be considered as ultimately responsible? Top management. Top management. That is why it is a corporate governance issue. Right. Because uh -huh. the governance or the directing and controlling principle of the organization is faulty here. Okay. Although it is okay. not specifically written that mm -hmm. employee mm -hmm. management is covered as part of corporate governance. But. As I gave you the example, you only said that it would go to the top level management. So that is why it is a corporate governance issue only. Okay, sir. got it. Okay. Yes. So now, uh, since uh, the time has ended, I won't take this discussion further because it is a big discussion. But for now, we have, I think, I personally believe that we have uh, framed the basic understanding of corporate governance. Now we would be understanding about, can I take two more minutes, please? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, so sir. now we would be discussing about uh, in the uh, next lecture, we would be discussing more about corporate governance. So you can see board leadership, how leadership should be there, right? How companies purpose should be decided, how division of responsibilities, which we commonly call as segregation of duties, right? Mm -hmm. How good practice, good delegation practice, of authority. Yes. How good practice regarding delegation of authority should be there. How composition and succession and evaluation of the employee should be done. How audit and risk and internal control should be there. And how remuneration of employees should be decided. So we would be understanding about them as part of corporate governance code. Then we would be discussing about audit committee. I'm sure we all must be aware about audit committee. But we would be understanding about that from an international point of view. The audit committee. Okay. Yes. Understood this point? Yes, sir. Okay, so now I'll share the PPTs uh, up to, uh, I think, till here. Can I share the corporate governance? Yeah, you can also include the going forward, what will we, will we be covering for Saturdays and Sundays, including uh, that. If although, it's uh, so I'll tell you, I just received a text from VGLD saying that I should upload the PPTs today. Okay, and now the concern is that these PPTs are somewhat half prepared. So see, okay, you can okay. see money laundering is to be prepared now. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay so, sir. So whatever we have covered till now, I think. Yes. So I'll share up to now, uh, up to here. That is the last slide that we have covered. And then from next session, I'll ensure that I'll share this one also with the corporate governance and going forward. Okay. Done. done. Okay. Yes. Thank you so okay. much. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so, Supreet, sir, can I yes. get your uh, contact number? I had to it discuss is... something. Yes, yes, it is on the WhatsApp group. No, you are on the WhatsApp group. Uh, they didn't add me till now, sir. Okay, not no. an issue. Uh, can we talk tomorrow, but sure, sir. Tomorrow would be fine. Okay, no, you can call me now also. Not an issue. I've just mentioned my number on the chat box. Can you see my number on the chat box? Yes, great. Okay, so you can call me just now. Uh, we'll discuss. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. See you next week.